All right, so uh, my problem always is that I have too many slides because uh, I'm going back to the foundations of cosmology and I've been doing this for 15 years now and uh, <coughs> unfortunately um, there are too many things to discuss and I've been trying to desperately cut down slides over the last uh, little, little wee while but um, so I'm going to talk about average expansion and variation of average expansion. And because this is about the cosmological principle, I decided I had to include some of the concepts and facts, but that will probably take me half the time at least. Um, and uh, the, the last section is really a different talk, but given the interest at this particular conference, I included that. So. I'm way over and we'll try and chop things as I go because I, I didn't manage to chop out enough slides. Okay, so what is dark energy? My claim, it's a misidentification of gradients and quasi-local energy in a geometry of complex evolving structures of matter and homogeneities, i.e. we have to go back to first principles. Now, um, the um, so a, a few important things, well, the universe is un inhomogeneous on certain scales. The, this is the logarithmic map of the universe produced by Gott et al. in 2005. And there is a particular coincidence that the universe appears to start accelerating um, around the epoch that structures become nonlinear uh, in at least, you know, there, there is some uh, sense in which you might think this looks reasonably homogeneous, but it's certainly very different later on. And of course, we have to be careful about typical and atypical inhomogeneities, because we've got the Sloan Great Wall there, we're, we're going to hear about some atypical inhomogeneities, but there's also typical inhomogeneities, and the ones which are of most interest um, because they form most of the volume of the universe are voids of about 30 over h megaparsecs in diameter with a density contrast very close to being empty. So these are old results, but they're confirmed in later surveys. And uh, so we have a cosmic web um, and these are the dominant structures and they're most of the, at least these, just these voids are 40% of the volume of the local universe. And if you look at voids on smaller scales, then it's fair to say that the universe is void dominated. Um, there is some notion of statistical homogeneity, and I'm happy to accept what um, Tamara and others have been doing on this. In, in the sense that something happens in there's something observable about the two-point galaxy correlation function, but that doesn't mean necessarily, and in fact I, I don't believe it's the case, that uh, delta rho over rho will go to zero as you um, take averages on ever large volumes. Um, it is an indication that as far as I'm concerned, that delta rho over rho is going to be bounded um, at the order of some percent. Uh, and there's a, you can do some, if you think that the Einstein equations only hold on small scales, then you can do a back of the envelope calculation, which is going to give this given cosmic variance. Uh, so the thing is, we see some notion of statistical homogeneity, but that doesn't mean that it is necessarily FLRW. In fact, I don't think that is the case. Uh, the, the baryon acoustic oscillation scale, in my view, is the reason why we have this as a scale, because below the scale, the initial fluctuations were um, perturbed, right? So, um, however, um, uh, and above the scale, they were not. So that's close to the linear regime, but uh, so this is a demarcation between where delta rho over rho is arbitrarily large and where it is bounded, as far as I'm concerned. We have a very complicated problem in general with general relativity because there is the question on what scale are Einstein's field equations valid. Einstein's equations are only really um, tested on the scale of things like the solar system, 
uh, black holes, uh, etc., on very, very small scales. And there is the general problem that uh, time evolution and averaging do not commute the problem of back reaction. Uh, so what I'm going to do is to follow uh, the, the general formalism um, that Roy Martins was talking about, that Asta Heinesen will be talking about, but make different model assumptions about how we interpret it. So a problem with all of this is that if we look at the Einstein field equations, we have the strong equivalence principle. Energy and momentum are covariantly conserved. They are not absolutely conserved. So energy is not an absolutely conserved quantity in general relativity, yet we put in um, exact symmetries into our models and we forget about a lot of things doing, which relate to uh, the fact that in general, we don't have killing vectors and we can only describe energy and momentum quasi-locally. So um, what I'm interested in is the problem of dust. What is dust? Traditionally, we thought of galaxies as dust, but ga galaxies are not homogeneously distributed. So uh, what is a dust particle? Well, it should have some um, mass that is invariant over the time scale of the problem. But actually what that means is that when you're coarse graining, you've got a coarse grain over all of the structures, we have a complicated problem of fitting one geometry inside another geometry. And uh, it also involves the problem of a averaging the energy momentum tensor, and that involves calibration of quantities which um, are associated with dust particles. So the notion of co-moving with the dust uh, in the FLRW model amounts to whatever we're doing, uh, we're always going to have uh, a case in which everything reduces to FLRW plus boosts. This does not have to be the case. And uh, that is what I'm going to describe. So what I'm interested in is how you calibrate rulers and clocks when you are doing this problem and doing it, realizing that actually we don't have killing vectors, we don't have um, uh, exact symmetries. The best we can do is think about quasi-local energy. And that is one of the hard problems in general relativity. There's no unique definition. So what I'm concerned with is how we actually calibrate rulers and clocks. And we've heard a lot about um, tilt here. So let me give an example of what I'm talking about. It's not going to be the case that I use, but it's a simple example to illustrate uh, the effect of having tilt over long periods of time. So if we have had two species of particles, let's call them dark matter and baryons, uh, then um, where we have some overdensity, say, but re things which are expanding at different rates, then uh, on average, uh, given many different motions, the ones that are going to, uh, if, if I've got a spherical blob, the ones that are, on, uh, are going to matter on average are the ones on this boundary. And if we integrate that tilt over a long period of time, then we're going to get something which is going to give a drift of the relative volume. So what I'm talking about is a collective degree of freedom of the background, the fact that we do not define the clock at infinity um, in any consistent uh, manner um, in general from first principles. So um, what um, I'm interested in then is thinking about a, a, a box, which I'm going to call a statistically homogeneous cell, but um, in the sense that on average, these things look the same if I um, are to define what I'm calling 
uh, an effective spatial hypersurface. But there are um, great density gradients of order one in anything which we have to, if we want to smooth out over all the nonlinear structures, then we have to smooth out over the largest typical structures. And we have to deal with the fact that actually we're dealing with a void dominated universe. There are density gradients of order one here. Uh, and uh, we're not in the linear regime of perturbation theory here. And we've got to worry about gradients and spatial curvature and gravitational energy between rulers and clocks, and bound structures and the volume average. So um, Copernican principle, I retain a Copernican principle. We are average observers for observers in a galaxy. Um, so, and in a Copernican principle, other observers and bound systems should also see uh, an isotropic CMB um, if we are typical observers, because we all see close to isotropic CMB. But there is nothing in theory principle or observation which will demand that any other observer, any other typical observer, measures the same mean CMB temperature or the same angular scales. So these are questions about the calibration of local rulers in terms of the angular scale and the CMB, and the frequency of a clock in terms of the same CMB temperature. So in other words, we have a mass biased view of the universe. Most of the universe is actually empty space, um, which is freely expanding. And yet when we smooth this out in the standard approach, we're assuming that uh, all of these differences below the scale of statistic homogeneity in terms of local observables don't matter. So the claim is actually maybe that's where we're going wrong because we haven't dealt with um, the consequences of the equivalence principle that we cannot localize energy and momentum. Uh, which relate to gravity. So gravitational energy is dynamical. It's well understood in things like frame dragging, but the claim here is that there are gradients in what we should think of as the kinetic energy of expansion. Um, so what I do is go back to first principles and think about the uh, strong equivalence principle in terms of uh, expanding regions. So if we were, to be in a fluid rather than empty space and ask, well, um, what, what should I think about in terms of what, what does the strong equivalence principle apply, imply, then it is that at some scale, so, in, and what I'm doing here is extending the, the strong equivalence principle, uh, we shouldn't be able to distinguish being at rest in a isotropically expanding space from uh, moving in a static space. So there is a sense in which the Doppler interpretation of um, uh, expansion of a certain type, because it's always to do with collective degree of freedom of the background, uh, that that uh, is indistinguishable um, so, uh, um, yeah, um, okay, uh, yeah, uh, uh, well, uh, so, um, yeah, there, there's a lot of stuff that goes <laughs> into all of this. So the claim is that this geometry should be considered to be a regional geometry that you have to go back to first principles, rethink about what you mean by the strong equivalence principle, look at a scale on which you can distinguish motion and expansion. And the claim is that on very small scales, that this is a relevant scale. And this is the one that we usually fit to the whole universe. And the claim is actually what we're doing is making a miscalibration and the particular miscalibration that is relevant is the one which is defining the asymptotic clock because we don't actually have absolute conservation laws anymore. So um, the relevant 
so the question is, what is the scale that this applies on? I call that region finite infinity. So um, it's a way, basically because it's a way of dealing with the fact that um, we don't have the perfect asymptotic clock. And I'm going to run out of time. I really, I see. <laughs> I've really got too many talks here. So, um, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I haven't uh, had time to prepare this problem. So, um, let, let's, so, so anyway, the claim here is that what we should be doing in the fitting problem is looking at a statistical geometry. The Hubble parameter is to some extent a gauge concept. Uh, and uh, I've built a phenomenology around this and uh, it works pretty well. Uh, it gives more uh, testable predictions. Uh, so the prints, so what I do is I use the Bukert averaging scheme, but I am reinterpreting uh, the averages because the Bukert averaging scheme um, is fine as long as you know exactly what a particle of dust is, as long as uh, the geodesics don't cross. But of course, they do cross within um, all bound structures. So we have to always renormalize and redefine what we define by dust. And that's where we have issues of calibration, as far as I'm concerned, because we haven't thought about problems which are in the too hard basket. So, the claim is that it should be, uh, to some extent, a, um, a gauge condition. And, uh, but we're dealing with quasi-local quantities. So what I do is I define a uniform quasi-local Hubble expansion condition. So uh, in other words, the, and the, the, uh, there are various justifications for this, that you can always find a uniform expansion even below the scale of statistical homogeneity uh, uh, by a relative calibration of rulers and clocks. So most of the, and this is just uh, um, generalizing natural principles of general relativity rather than, um, uh, rather than starting from a top-down approach and imposing things from the beginning. So I have, and uh, the claim is that this should originate from things in the early universe, uh, and we can have long discussions about that, uh, but there should be a statistical geometry. So in the early universe, there is something um, which is close to a conformal symmetry. There's a question of what defines scale. There is a breaking of scale invariance uh, on small scales, but in some sense that is still maintained on large scales. Um, if that sound, doesn't sound like a tautology. But um, so there is a conformal matching procedure and uh, it will give a difference between bare or volume average quantities and uh, dressed or statistical parameters. So, and to do this, I'm talking about a weak field effect. So uh, one problem that people have when, is I'm going to end up with a phenomenological lapse function. The phenomenological lapse function is going to lead to large differences in what people interpret as the age of the universe. But for observers and bound systems whose relative volume deceleration has been the same from very similar initial conditions, there's not going to be any difference. And that relative volume deceleration is effectively a drift of the canonical clock of an observer in a finite infinity region. So I'm going to smooth over all of the things that are going on inside because I'm only interested in the kinetic energy of expansion rather than all the other th complicated things that go in here, which have to do with uh, all of, you know, the, this rotational energy, th thermal energy of, in clusters. There's lots of stuff going on in there, um, but I'm going to smooth over all of that. So, and there is a relative deceleration, and you can work out what that relative deceleration is after you go away and fit data. Um, and, uh, and it's very small. 
and it, it, as a fraction of the Hubble parameter at any time, um, it is increasing, but it's it's always it starts off you know, close to ten to the minus six. The present epoch, for some reason, um, it coincides with the Mond scale, and that is uh, in fact better than um, better than. It's, it's not just numerology related to the Hubble constant because it's actually involving a derivative of relative volume deceleration. Why that is, I don't know, but that's the case. So what you do is there, there are bare parameters and dress parameters. The volume average observer sees no apparent acceleration. A wall observer does. Uh, and when a certain parameter, the void fraction reaches 59%. Okay, so there's no cosmic coincidence problem, it's related to the void fraction. Now you can go away and do lots of data fitting and uh, you can do naive data fitting, you just take values from Lambda CDM, um, you'll come up with parameters. The Hubble tension, there are different, when you're below the scale of statistical homogeneity, then uh, as a wall observer, you'll see a different expansion rate in the thin filament. And this is indeed, so this is from flitting, fitting Planck data. It's got nothing to do with local measurements. Uh, the maximum rate that a wall observer will see across a void is 75, of order of 75 kilometers per second per megaparsec. This is what you'd see within the Virgo cluster. And that it actually, people usually talk about infall, even though the distance is always increasing, but actually this is what you'd get. Um, and so the thing is, our, there, there are different ages of the universe. The age of the universe is not a, um, a, a singular concept in the way that we usually split, split space and time. You can go away and do, of course, this is naive because that's with a cosmic, with assuming Lambda CDM model, actually, you should do this. And so, um, all of the hard stuff and so involves um, doing this sort of thing, but then you actually need the full statistical geometry. And I, what I have so far is just a phenomenology. So the full statistical geometry, I call it modified geometry rather than modified gravity. Einstein's equations are retained on small scales. We don't change the action. We're changing something. It's, it's you know, a, it's a, the picture of, of how you embed uh, small regions into big regions, just as you embed the um, a local inertial frame into an Einstein geometry with the strong equivalence principle. Um, the when you're looking at first derivatives of an expansion, and that's what the Hubble parameter is. It's a, it's like a connection. Uh, then. Um, then uh, that's, that's where you have to actually have a, a different geometrical construct other than, um, other than cutting and pasting exact solutions of Einstein's equations. Right, okay, I'm gonna run out of time. So average expansion, you can go away and do tests. So, and, so the, the one that I'm interested in is the clarkson bassett lu test, because if space expands rigidly, as it does in um, the, the Friedman model, you can go away and have an H of Z and a D of Z. And you can, and the timescape model here is interpolating between three different Lambda CDM models. Uh, but it, uh, it is, so this is one which is best fit to the Planck data. And that will be a different Lambda CDM model with different parameters at, at small redshifts. And um, if you put into equation of state, you'll get things which are amusing, but um, because it's not a Friedman model. But you can take the Friedman model, take something which is constant, and construct your effective dressed parameters here, H and D, and you'll get something which is this, and this is the uh, data of um, well, the analysis of uh, Sapone Majoretto Nesseris. Uh, and so there's the timescape prediction, there's the best fit, uh, this should be close to zero. Um, and of course, it is close to zero within the um, 
within the uncertainties there back in 2014 using whatever data they had. Uh, the prediction here is the timescape model. So I predict that, um, you know, and whether this is exactly correct or not, um, this is a ballpark. So uh, we should see a falsification of Lambda CDM over this range of redshift, which is achievable provided you actually, so there are lots of issues about data reduction um, with, uh, <clears throat> with, uh, there's lots of issues about systematics, which I don't have time to go into. Um, so variation expansion below, which is, so here are, uh, below the scale of statistical homogeneity is actually very interesting. So because um, the idea here is that we shouldn't be reducing everything to motion, we, what we should be, the, 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 actually the, the thing that is closest to, um, a preferred frame in any sense is our own finite infinity region and that for our case is going to be very close to the local group because you've got to make a distinction between bound structures and where space is freely expanding where space is freely expanding it's not necessary it's not going to be um, uh, just boosts everywhere so you can go away and test that and we find um, so I don't have time for all of that. So I, I was trying to add all this in and try and somehow, because I know this is what people here are interested in, uh, but uh, I haven't succeeded. So <laughs> in cutting my slides down, that's why I was, was so anyway, um, you see, uh, so the claim here is what, what do we find that the, if you take spherical averages, so we're using the data, so here, Take averages in shells. Uh, also do angular averages. So we've done the equivalent of McClure, et cetera. We've done both, we've done all of that. Uh, and uh, where you should see, it's only when you have some shell where there are as many structures as the typical structures, then you'll see an asymptotic average Hubble expansion. It's below the scale that you see something different. Of course, this is what people think about in the usual peculiar velocities way of thinking about everything in terms of reducing everything to boosts. But the point is that when it is non-kinematic, there can be differences and those differences will come out as spurious effects. And as far as we're concerned, we see the signal of that in a spurious boost because the spherically averaged expansion is significantly more uniform in the local group frame. And I, I didn't expect it to be so fantastically um, um, such a, a, a beautiful signal, but uh, a lot of careful work went into that. A lot of 12 million mocks of, uh, we, we've done a lot of, lot of tests on this and we had a log be greater than five. Now, of course you can get a similar thing in terms of, um, in terms of uh, bulk flows. So the claim here is that on the large scale, um, either there are bulk flows, which are very large and then will be discrepant with something else, or it is non-kinematic. And the thing is we can define what non-kinematic means um, and we can actually go away and ha have toy models of non-kinematic dipoles and actually test them. And that's what we've done. In ray tracing, so this is purely to, to cut out all of the other stuff, purely a toy model and asymptotically normalized to, lam, to a, a, a Planck lambda model on oh, scales larger than 100 megaparsecs. Put yourself in, you, you need to have Zekra's models, LTB is too simple. And in fact, this one is, um, so you can match a significant non-kinematic contribution, so non-kinematic in the sense that it doesn't have the same expansion powers of V over C. And you will get, um, you'll get interesting things. So, um, and the idea is that, well, you should actually not only match the CMB, but also um, the local flows. And that's what we've been doing and that's what we uh, I mean 
I mean, re return to this now. I mean, we did this five years ago, right? Uh, there was a little bug in our ray tracer as far as some of the local structure is concerned, not, uh, and uh, so, which just is relates, the, the, these Zekeres models, uh, which have an overdensity in addition to uh, avoid, so they've got overdensities and underdensities, are too simplistic. We actually have to, you can rotate the shells, uh, it's just, it's much more complicated than the ones with just a, a single axis as these ones have. So, uh, yeah, I must be, so uh, just one, one thing, uh, those people didn't think about this because they're thinking about things like the Reese Sharma effect, but not, uh, so if you were to move across a structure here, you get what you expect from the Reese Sharma effect is when you're in the structure uh, and that <laughs> you don't. So um, you, you get millikelvin and the millikelvin um, dipole is going to have its own um, quadrupoles and things. And I'm very interested in trying to distinguish that. Um, so as far as, you know, and that's why I'm interested in various discussions I've been having. And uh, so in the, the discussion we had this morning, is people, everyone else is thinking about uh, a dipole on the surface of large scattering. It, it, and from what I understand, the discussion between Douglas Scott and uh, Miguel Cantin is uh, there are lots, there's degeneracies, and, and I, I think that is the case. But so I'm interested in finding out what is, uh, how can we d distinguish uh, something which is non kinematic locally in the foreground of order one. Um, which is like being inside the lens. It's not lensing looking through something. Uh, and, uh, you know, be because that, that's an important thing. I've discussed, uh, and I've, I've discussed this with Francois Boucher some years ago, because um, ideally you could actually test this if you were to redraw the sky maps, right? Um, but it, actually the removal of the galaxy is intimately involved in the um, dipole subtraction and so it's a really hard problem yeah we we'll probably have to go back to the time order data so it's it's not a trivial thing to test but ultimately that is a further prediction of where we should see a big difference and so that's why i'm interested in all these um claims about non-kinematic dipoles because that is precisely the sort of signature not just of this particular model but of many inhomogeneous cosmologies and um, it's where I think we could um, have something to offer. So I've too many slides and I'll stop there. Um, you know, I, I, I wasn't able to collapse the two talks into one uh, in the time available. All right. Thank you very much, David. Thank you for your nice talk. Um, it's very good. We are over time by about five minutes. Um, so yeah. if there's any uh, very quick question, we can ask it now. Otherwise, I mean, there's time for discussion at the end. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. so if you, yeah, if it's okay, I think we'll we'll move on. Um, yeah, Maurice put his hand up, but we can talk. We can talk in the discussion. So thank you very much, David. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay. So if you could stop sharing your screen. Okay, Damien. Yes. Can you uh, can you share? So it's fine. Uh, it's fine. Yeah, we can see. Uh, now, Damien Hudsimekas. I'm sorry if I butchered your name. Uh, is going to talk about large scale alignments of quasar polarization. So uh, you have 30 minutes. Uh, please start when you're ready, Damien. Okay. So. Uh, for first, uh, thank you for this invitation to this very nice uh, conference. And I will uh, present to you some uh, the observational evidence so for large scale alignment of quasar polarization and also possible uh, implication for cosmology. So this is a work we started uh, about 20 years ago and still continuing with several collaborators. The outline of the talk will be the following. So I will first briefly describe the origin and characteristic of optical polarization in quasar. Then I will describe the large scale alignment of quasar polarization vector, the statistics and possible contamination. I will try to characterize a bit more the uh, alignment effect. 
and then some interpretation, evidence for a preferred axis. And finally, I will end with alignment of quasar axis themselves, since the polarization is related to the quasar structure and uh, alignment with the large scale structure. So the UV optical polarization in active galactic nuclei and quasar uh, is uh, illustrated here. So this is typical uh, uh, nearby uh, active galactic uh, uh, nuclei. So you see the host galaxy, so the uh, nucleus. So here we have the, we zoom, so we have the nucleus ionization cone, the radio jet in this case. And if we go really deep, we might see the obscuring torus with the black hole inside. What is interesting is this map, so which corresponds to this uh, uh, ionization cone. So we see the polarization, uh, which is measured here, uh, and is very high in the ultraviolet, about 10% of uh, polarization degree. And we see a centrosymmetric polarization pattern, which indicate the scattering. So the polarization is due to scattering of the nuclear light, Inside the dust sublimation radius, it's due to electrons, and outside it can be due so to dust. And in this case, as we can see, so the vector, we can uh, easily see that uh, polarization is perpendicular to the radio jets. So quasar in the radio quite uh, can be usually divided into two types, the type 2, type 1. The type 2 have narrow emission lines, and the type 1 have both narrow and broad emission lines. And their optical polarization of the, the properties are different. The type 2 have polarization which are quite high, uh, higher than 3%. The polarization is perpendicular to the radio axis, and this suggests polar scattering. In the type 1, the polarization is uh, lower, typically around 1%. It's most often parallel to the radio axis, and sometimes it can be perpendicular. So this led to the AGN unification model, which is summarized here. So here we have the central black hole, the accretion disk, the broad emission line region, the narrow line emission region, which is much bigger, the jets, and the dusty torus, which obscures some line of sight. So the type one have broad lines, so they are see, you see fully the, uh, the center of the quasar, and the polarization is uh, uh, parallel to the radio jet because it's due to scattering in the equatorial plane. And the type two, the central part is obscured and we have perpendicular scattering. And in between, where we have some absorption, we have type one quasar with perpendicular polarization. So in the following, we will only consider type 1 quasar with either parallel or perpendicular polarizations. So now, what do I mean by large scale alignment of quasar polarization vectors? So this is a map uh, toward the North Galactic Pole. So you have right, right ascension, declination here, and two redshift cut lower than one, and here between one and two. So this is the distribution of the polarization degree, distribution of the, sorry, of the polarization angle here. And we immediately see by eye that the uh, polarization vector are not randomly distributed. So they have some uh, mean value and the probability that it's due to uh, random uh, distribution is low or the order of 10 to the minus three. So at such scale, which are scale around uh, one gigaparsec at a redshift about one, we would clearly expect to have randomly distributed polarization vector. So it's interesting to go back to the, uh, the first uh, hints to this uh, alignment. So in this case, this was uh, a smaller sample, so 170 quasar, and in that region of the sky, we clearly see some uh, alignment. So it was quite uh, easy to define a box in the sky and just to predict from this uh, alignment what we can observe. So we did some more observation in this uh, volume of the sky just to confirm that uh, the alignment are real or not. 
and this is what we found. So each time we had more observation, the effect become more and more significant. So now with a, a sample uh, distributed around, uh, over the whole sky, so we can uh, do global statistical analysis. So the sample is a sample of 355 polarized quasar up to redshift 2.5. So previous studies were done with 170 and 213 quasars. Uh, they are uh, constituted of new observation and compilation from uh, data from the literature. So this is an inhomogeneous sample. Some quasars were preferred, bright, just for uh, observational reason, broad absorption line, red and radiolog quasar, because usually they are more polarized. Blazar were excluded because the polarization is variable and the redshift is uncertain. The only object at high galactic latitude uh, were uh, considered to uh, minimize the effect of interstellar polarization. And uh, we only consider also polarization degree higher than 0.6%, also for the same reason. And finally, we put a cut on the quality of the data set an uncertainty of the polarization angle lower than 14 degrees, which correspond to two sigma on the polarization degree. So the question is, are the polarization angle uniformly distributed on the sky? So I will not go into the detail of the statistical test. It's just important to realize that we need circular statistics because we are dealing with angle. So we consider mainly two tests. So the dispersion of angle for a number of neighbors. And in the second test, we compare the polarization vector of a quasar to the resultant vector of a number of neighbors. So there is one parameter in this test, which is the number of nearest neighbors. Since we consider a large region of the sky, so and because the polarization angle are defined with respect to the north-south direction, it depends on the uh, coordinate system. So it's uh, useful to consider also coordinate invariant statistics, which can be achieved by a parallel transport of polarization vector. So the significance was evaluated through Monte Carlo simulation by shuffling the angle over position. So the advantage of shuffling uh, with respect to building random symbol is that we keep the original value of the polarization angle. And if there is a bias in the full sample, it's not taken into account. And then the significance level is as usual estimated as the percentage of simulated configuration where the statistic is uh, smaller than the measured statistic. And so in this plot, we see so the significant level here against the number of netball. And it's, it's interesting to see the evolution with the size of the sample. So the first sample of 170 quasar, and then more quasar, and even more. So each time we add some data, it's more and more difficult to reproduce the observed alignment with random distribution. So in this plot is uh, the same, but we consider four different tests. So the two tests uh, I uh, presented uh, before with and with all parallel transport. And we see that all these tests agree and show that the quasar polarization vector are not randomly oriented over the sky with a significant level we see, which is lower than 0.1%. So clearly it can be due to some contamination. This is the first thing we, we think uh, about. Is there systematic instrumental polarization? So in fact, we measured uh, unpolarized and polarized standard star, and the po instrumental polarization is very low. It's lower than 0.5%, so it's negligible, and the angle of set is within one degree, so it cannot affect our measurements. The, another argument is that the polarization degree and angle were measured in different surveys with different instruments, and the uh, measurements do agree within the quoted error. So the contamination between the instrument is not significant. But it's much more annoying 
is the effect of interstellar polarization. So this is the polarization due to elongated dust grain aligned with the galactic magnetic field. So you probably know this nice picture here, which show the starlight polarization. So there are more than 5,000 stars. And you see uh, the polarization vector in the galactic plane, in this case for uh, low distance and higher distance stars. And you see the structure of the galactic magnetic field. And this is why we cut off sample to galactic latitude higher than 30 degrees. At this latitude, the polarization of the star is illustrated here, and it's usually lower than 0.2, uh, 0.3 percent. The distribution of polarization degree of quasar is here, and as we see, if we cut the sample to 0.6 percent, most of the polarization is intrinsic to the quasar. So we really minimize the effect of interstellar polarization. But I think a very simple argument is this picture. So the interstellar polarization, which is in our galaxy, is unlikely to be responsible of observed alignment because its effect must be the same at all redshift. So we would expect the same alignment at low and high redshift, which is not observed. So if there is contamination, for example, at low redshift, and if we correct for it, we have an even stronger effect at large redshift. So since we have a map uh, uh, of the sky, so we can uh, see where the most significant alignment uh, come from. So in this plot, so for each object, we have the local statistic. And the bigger the circle, the more significant uh, is the, the, the alignment around this quasar. And we can see that there are many quasar, many alignment there and there. So in a region which are roughly opposite on the sky. But this must be seen with caution because the sky coverage is incomplete. For example, here we have no measurements. <clears throat> so this is another view more or less of the same. So as I told you, the polarization angle are defined with respect to the north-south direction. So they depend on the coordinate system. So we can consider the global statistic uh, as a function of the coordinate system, as a function then of the position of the pole of the sky. And this is illustrated in this figure. So by defining many poles, so many coordinate systems, we have uh, more or uh, we have higher significance or lower significance. And again, we see that there is some kind of opposite position, which may define an axis. <coughs> Sorry. Since we have the redshift, so we can see this in a three-dimensional uh, volume. So the bigger the sphere and the redder uh, the color, it uh, indicates the uh, most significant alignment. So we can see that we have a kind of uh, axis there of the most significant regions of alignments. And this is also extremely interesting. So again, the significance is uh, illustrated with the size of the spheres. But here we encode with the color the polarization angles. So as you can see on this scale, so here we have more or less 20 degrees. It's uh, get more or less uh, 50, 60, uh, 120 and 140, 150. So we see that along this uh, axis, we have a regular rotation of the polarization angle. And this is an observation which can really uh, help at some point to identify the reason of such uh, alignment. And finally, uh, since we suspect that there is a, an axis, so we can compare to other position in the sky. So this is the quasar polarization axis, let's say, so where the, which corresponds to the most significant position of the alignment. And we compare to the CMB dipole and also to the so-called axis of Evil, which was defined some time ago. And we see that they are all in the same uh, part of the sky. So is it coincidence or does it really indicate some violation 
on the cosmological principle. So the question is clearly open. Now it's interesting <coughs> to have a look at the radio wavelengths. So uh, polarization at radio wavelengths is interesting because it's less contaminated by the interstellar polarization. But on the other hand, it's more contaminated by instrumental biases. So we consider this sample as uh, other groups, in fact. Uh, essentially, it's uh, useful because the Faraday rotation is negligible in this sample. So about 4,000 flat spectrum radio source was considered with high polarized flux. And out of this sample, about 1,500 have reliable redshift. So different studies have uh, led to different results. So the first study uh, found no evidence of polarization alignment on the Gaparsec scale. Then significant alignment were found on smaller scale. Uh, so it, uh, typically we scale typically about uh, 150 megaparsec. And on larger scale, but considering low polarization source, so low polarization source are more prone to be contaminated, unfortunately. And finally, if we select in those uh, sources only quasar, then we have an uh, alignment uh, on scale which are uh, quite big, so 600 uh, megaparsec scale, and they correspond more or less to the location of the optical alignments at higher frequency. Uh, with a lower, uh, some, with a smaller sample, uh, there is no evidence of polarization alignment. So there is some confirmation, but it's not really uh, clear if there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the optical alignment and the radio alignments. So if we want to go toward an interpretation, there are two main possibilities. So. In the first case, the quasar polarization is modified along the line of sight. And a small systematic polarization, for example, can be added uh, along the propagation of the light. The second case, the polarization is totally interesting to the quasar, and the quasar axis themselves over light. So this means that, in fact, when we speak of uh, quasar axis, this is the supermassive black hole spin ax axis. And there has been several uh, interpretations, for example, polarization from intergalactic dust, but dust is not really uh, uh, clearly, the presence of dust is not demonstrated in the intergalactic medium, so and there are not much dust, so this would require a strong magnetic field over a huge domain. Another possibility was polarization from photon action mixing, so it was a nice interpretation because several aspect of the observation were reproduced, but uh, this mechanism also produced a lot of circular polarization, which was not observed. Other possibilities are cosmic strings, primordial large-scale magnetic field, anisotropic expansion of the universe or global rotation. So with such mechanism, we can expect either an effect on the polarization itself or on the quasar spin axis since, for example, uh, global rotation will uh, could uh, affect the quasar spin axis themselves. So it's interesting to see if there are also alignment of quasar axis, so uh, with respect to each other, if they are aligned to the raw structure, and if this occurs on very large scales. And so this is based on the fact that there is a known correlation between the polarization and the quasar structure, as we have already, already seen for radio quiet, but it's also occurs for radio loud quasar. So in general, the optical polarization angle is parallel to the radio jet, while the radio polarization angle is most often perpendicular to the radio jet. Also some alignment of the galaxy orientation or spin axis have been found with their cluster, filaments, sheets, up to scale up to 30 megaparsec. And a recent observation has, has shown that filaments themselves may be spinning on very large scales. So we consider the polarization of quasar in large quasar groups. So this is one of the biggest quasar uh, groups. 
which was uh, found by Graus et al. It's called a huge and close Campuzano large Rosa group. And as you see, it reached a scale of about one gigaparsec. So it's about nine, there were about 90 objects in this, uh, in this group. So we can define the orientation of the substructure. We measure the polarization of about 90 quasars in this group. Out uh, of this sample, about 19 have significant polarization, so higher than 0.6%, and they are represented in this plot. And here is the difference of the angle uh, between the structure angle and the polarization angle. And we see that polarization vector are either parallel or perpendicular to the large scale structure, and that this is significant. We can do a bit more if we consider that the polarization angles uh, depend on the inclination of the object. And we can estimate the inclination of the object by the width of the broad lines. So if we correct uh, the polarization angle of the object with the larger uh, broad emission line width, we have this kind of picture. The effect is much more significant. And it's indicated that the quasar axis or preferentially parallel to the axis of the host large scale structure. So this might indicate that, in fact, the origin of uh, polarization vector alignment is more due to uh, the fact that the quasar axis themselves are aligned. So at radio wavelengths, we did a similar work, but since they are so, instead of measuring the polarization of object in one group, we consider several groups, and in each group, we try to find a polarized quasar, and we consider only those groups with at least one polarized quasar inside. So we define the axis of the quasar group, and we compare to the polarization vector of the quasar in those groups. And finally, we find that the polarization vector are mostly perpendicular to the major axis, and then consequently the quasar axis of parallel to the major axis, which confirm what we have found at optical wavelengths. So the typical size of this group is uh, 300 megaparsec. So can we relate this to, to the bigger uh, uh, region of alignment we have found? So, and there's this interesting study which uh, show that the large quasar group themselves were apparently coriented, uh, coherently oriented over scale reaching, reaching uh, 1.6 gigaparsec. So this may link the, the polarization alignment at various scale and explain if the, uh, the quasar axis are related to their host structure and if the large quasar group themselves are aligned with respect to each other, we can have very large uh, scale alignments. And very recently, several groups have investigated the uh, alignment of radio jet. So there are, uh, we have here so the data set. So the tests which were used, sometimes in 2D or 3D. So uh, in many cases, the redshift are not known. And when the redshift are known, so this can be done in three-dimensional. Uh, analysis, but uh, then the sample are smaller. Also, the size of the survey are not uh, sometimes not big enough to test a very large uh, scale, but we see that there are signal at various scale, uh, 30 megaparsec in the first cases, and here we reach uh, 500, 900 megaparsec. So the last study is a bit different because, because it considered the BLAC clustering. So, in fact, uh, BLAC or quasar, which have their jets oriented towards uh, the observer. So, if we consider the clusterings of BLAC compared to the clustering of uh, other uh, radio source, if we see that uh, we, are some, we have some clustering, this means that the uh, jets which are oriented toward the observer are aligned. So let's now consider this study because it gives some region on the sky. So these are the region of the sky where the 
polarization de, de, sorry, the radio jet alignment are very strong. So we see that they can define a very big region of the sky. So just for information, this is the, the position of the large weather group we have studied. And this is uh, the position of the optical polarization uh, axis than we discussed before. So it's more or less again in the same position, but it's not clear in this case if we see an axis of radio jet alignment. So to conclude, so we find uh, that there is uh, several evidences for uh, large scale alignment of uh, quasar polarization vector from radio observation, from optical observation, uh, with very big sizes. The effect seems stronger along, along an axis, which is close to the CMB axis of evil and the dipole. An interesting observation is that the mean polarization angles uh, rotates along this axis. Apparently, the quasar axis themselves of uh, uh, coherently oriented of, on large scale. And this uh, obviously uh, raises uh, the questions. So if such alignment indicate departure to the fundamental cosmological absorption of large scale isotropy or large scale homogeneity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Damien. Very nice talk. Uh, so uh, we have time for a question. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. Okay, we have uh, Owen. Thank you, Damien. I put it in the chat as well, right? So it seems like these large um, quasar groups, uh, you know, after their, particularly the huge one, you know, I think 2011, 2012, was criticized in this paper. That's what's now in the chat. And, uh, you know, they looked at the algorithm, they looked at the statistics. Um, there was also some sort of, you know, they tried to, you know, I, they defined homogeneity as some sort of average quantity. Um, but it seems like your alignments are pointing to this thing being, you know, it gives, gives some support to these very large structures. Yes, I think to find uh, uh, alignment of polarization within this large structure gives support to the large structure. So now, well, there has been some question about if uh, it's a, a problem for the large scale homogeneity or not. So this is just a matter of scale. So I think there is uh, argument for and against. So this is not really uh, the point here for, I think that such large structure, uh, uh, well, the, you can have many of such structures in the sky, so. Well, yeah, I so see... what I find interesting here, Damien, is that your results are later than this uh, tw 2013 paper. Um, so it may be interesting to revisit this paper. I don't know. Which, paper, I don't know. which paper do you mean? Uh, it's in the chat, so it's... Uh... Oh, okay. If I may interrupt, this is a paper by my ex-student uh, Seshadri Narathur, yeah. who in fact I suggested should look at that issue. Uh, what is the statistical chance of seeing structures such as the huge LQG uh, uh, simply by chance probability? And the issue is the following. I think uh, you will agree that uh, you are talking about such rare events that uh, standard statistics is not uh, applicable. You have to use uh, extreme uh, statistics because you're on the tail of a very steeply falling distribution. And so, as you know, people always criticize by saying this is uh, estimating after the fact, you know, this is all post facto. And the only way to rebut that is to uh, demonstrate convincingly that using extreme value statistics say on large you know, Hubble volume simulations versus the real data, that you do find uh, a significant evidence that these are not statistical fluctuations. And uh, I wonder if you have done tests of that kind. Uh, well, I have not checked myself the, uh, well, the statistics for the large quasar group themselves. So. I just consider the polarization in such group. So even mm -hmm. if it's not uh, 
if it's the tail of the statistic, uh, it well, it has no effect of, on the result since it's just uh, we, what we found is polarization alignment. With, that is quite striking. I agree. That is quite but, striking. But there is, well, uh, is the problem or not? It's not really the, the problem here. Yeah, it's just a matter of quantifying it. But I think we'll hear more from uh, Roger Clavis, uh, who yes, has in fact done such, such tests, um, and he might talk about it later. Okay, thanks. So we have to uh, uh, to move on. So Dominic, you have a hand up, but uh, maybe in the discussion session you can ask your question. If that's okay. Yeah, let's let's move on. Okay, thanks, Dominic. Okay, thank you very much again, uh, Damien, for your very nice talk. So if you could uh, close your screen. And that's that. Damien? Hello, Damien. Could you stop your screen sharing, please? Ah, thank you. Okay, Esther, are you there? Uh, yes. Hi, morning, Esther. Hi. Uh, <laughs> let's see if I can find. Uh, can I share my screen now? It's uh, you should be able to. You should be able to. Yeah. Post. Thank uh, you. Uh, it might take a minute. It's okay. Oh, okay, now I see. Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, now Asta Heinesen is going to talk about anisotropic cosmography. So you have 30 minutes. Uh, please start when you're ready, Asta. All right. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, anisotropic uh, cosmography. Uh, cosmography is, is short for uh, saying analyzing universe data, um, making as little assumption as, as possible. Um, and in particular, I've, I've been working on uh, how we might incorporate uh, anisotropic uh, effects in our observables uh, in a, a consistent way. Uh, so I will uh, talk about how we might expand or improve on existing data analysis uh, strategies, both for upcoming, but also for present uh, data sets. Um, and I will in particular uh, talk about what information we might expect to ex extract, extract from uh, data without making a priori assumptions about uh, the geometry of our universe or the field equations that govern this geometry. Uh, in terms of observables, I will talk about standardizable objects uh, and I will talk about relative drift signals and I will discuss things in the end. Uh, yeah, so I'll just uh, skip the introduction of uh, where I say that the universe is uh, inhomogeneous. Uh, I think you all, all know that. Um, so the, the task here is to um, formulate um, observables um, under a, a minimal set of assumptions where we uh, in particular give up um, assumptions about um, strict uh, homogeneity and isotropy of spatial sections of our universe. Um, and uh, uh, here I will talk about uh, two different observables, so luminosity distance that's defined um, through the uh, as the square root of the ratio of intrinsic luminosity and um, and the flux of an astrophysical object, uh, and uh, in order to measure luminosity distance, we need uh, objects that are um, in cosmology. We need objects that are standardizable in terms of their luminosity. Um, here, uh, supernova of type one A are uh, popular standard candles. Uh, also, we are starting to be able to use gravitational waves as independent distance measures. Um, I will also talk about redshift drift signals, which are the uh, which is the change in time of redshift of an astrophysical object, and uh, this is an um, upcoming precision measurement that we're going to uh, be able to do through uh, various uh, transition lines of the hydrogen atom. Uh, and before going to some 
um, general uh, prescriptions of these observables, um, I will just uh, I will just uh, review some uh, results in the in the literature for the uh, um, for for these observables in um, in the FLW geometrical setting. Uh, here we can write the luminosity distance um, as um, as a series expansion in redshift, where you would all um, know the, the first order term here, which is the usual uh, Hubble law, which it prescribes the proportionality law between distances and redshifts of sources close enough to the um, to the observer. Uh, when we go to higher order, we have the deceleration parameter entering, which is the second time derivative of the scale factor, and it comes with a minus sign uh, by convention. When we go to third order, we have uh, the so-called jerk parameter entering, which is the third time deriv derivative of the scale factor. And uh, we also have curvature entering through the FLW spatial curvature parameter. Um, and uh, in a sim similar way, we uh, can write the redshift uh, signal in uh, the FLW geometrical setting, and we can expand it. Um, here I've just Written the series expansion to, to third order in uh, to first order in redshift because this is what I've managed to find useful expressions for in the general case uh, so far. Uh, and here we see that uh, the first order term is given um, as a as a product of the deceleration parameter and the Hubble parameter, and it comes with a minus sign uh, such that positive detections of redshift drift uh, signals are direct. Uh, uh, signatures of um, of an, excel, uh, an accelerating uh, space time in the FLW uh, geometric setting, and these are uh, purely geometrical results. They rely only on assuming um, uh, the FLW uh, metric, but not on assuming um, any particular field equations that govern the FLW scale factor. And so, uh, analysis that rely on these. Uh, uh, results are, are sometimes referred to as FLW cosmography. And um, when, um, uh, when we're now interested in formulating uh, cosmographies uh, where uh, we give up the assumption about isotropy and uh, homogeneity, um, we, lo we lose uh, the nice, the nice uh, property that uh, our observables are isotropic uh, 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 over our sky. And it's not at all uh, clear that we would be able to formulate uh, nice compact uh, expressions for our cosmographies in the general case. Um, but uh, I will show you that uh, it is in fact possible to, to write down uh, uh, nice uh, useful expressions for the uh, generic uh, geometrical case. Um, so the task now is to generalize these isotropic uh, cosmographic uh, results um, to, a, to a, a cosmography without any exact symmetries. And um, the results I'm going to show you here, first of all, luminosity distance is, uh, are given in uh, this uh, paper, and it um, uh, relies on uh, uh, results from uh, previous uh, uh, papers uh, by, for instance, uh, Christian and Sachs, who I think were the first to write down uh, serious ex expansions of um, cosmological uh, ob uh, observables, um, and uh, also some um, uh, there are some uh, uh, later nice papers by uh, by Chris Clarkson, uh, George Ellis, uh, Roy Martins, uh, and Obina Ume, and collaborators. Um, and so the, the task uh, now is to take the uh, to, to to take the luminosity uh, distance uh, cosmography uh, as it uh, looks in an FLW uh, space time and generalize this to an uh, arbitrary space time setting by um, by mapping the FLW Hubble deceleration jerk and uh, curvature parameters into appropriate um, anisotropic and uh, uh, inhomogeneous uh, parameters that we can think of as generalized cosmological parameters that will um, vary uh, with the point of observation and vary over the observer's 
uh, sky on account of the uh, breaking of uh, translational and rotational symmetry. Um, yeah, and uh, I can just show you how um, these parameters uh, look um, in the. Uh, so this this is really the, the general case where uh, where minimal assumptions are, are made. We 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 need uh, to uh, assume a, a general relativistic congruence uh, descript description uh, and um, uh, the, uh, that that light travels on null geodesics. Um, that Etherington's reciprocity theorem for relating angular diamond distance to luminosity distance uh, holds. And we need to assume that luminosity distance is in fact a well-defined uh, uh, function of redshift, which we can, uh, for which we can uh, define a, a Taylor series expansion. But other than that, uh, the setting is generic. Uh, so, and here we see that uh, the uh, Hubble uh, uh, parameter uh, generalizes uh, to this uh, function, which is uh, given by the rate of change of photon energy along the uh, photon null ray. Uh, so this is a very natural uh, generalization of the FLW Hubble parameter on the observer's uh, light cone. Um, also, we have at higher order that um, uh, the distillation parameter is given in terms of a in terms of the uh, derivative of uh, this uh, curly H function generalizing the Hubble parameter. When we go to third order, we have curvature entering through this Ricci focusing term, which tells us how uh, photons are converging as they approach the observer. And we also have the uh, generalized drag parameter, which is given in terms of the uh, second derivative of um, the curly H function. And now we can exploit that these uh, effective cosmological parameters can be written in uh, as a nice uh, 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 compact um, uh, expressions through a multiple uh, decomposition uh, in the uh, direction of uh, incoming lights as seen by the observer. So this is really just the uh, direction of the source on the observer's uh, sky, uh, which um, I represent here by uh, the direction vector uh, E. And we, when we expand in this uh, direction vector, uh, we find that the uh, generalized Hubble parameter is given, uh, given as a, uh, on exact form as a, as a truncated multiple series at quadrupolar order, where the monopolar term uh, describes the isotropized expansion rate uh, in the vicinity of the uh, observer. Um, uh, at, um, as, a, as a dipolar uh, term, we have uh, four acceleration of the observer uh, entering when uh, the observer is, uh, is not uh, geodesic. Uh, and we also have a, 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 a shear term uh, entering at a quadrupolar order, uh, which describes the anisotropic deformation of, of space. And uh, this is a very natural generalization of the, of the um, FLW Hubble parameter, uh, the monopolar term that describes the uh, isotropized expansion rate of space. Uh, this is uh, this is really how we what what the FLW uh, parameter parameter uh, tells us in FLW physics. Uh, but now we have that uh, this um, uh, that the expansion uh, local expansion rate of, of space can vary uh, across observers on account of um, of uh, the breaking of uh, translational uh, invariance. Uh, also, we have that um, uh, that the shear tensor um, enters here as a as a natural contribution. It tells us um, yeah that that space is now going to uh, to expand anisotropically around the observer. So if the observer is looking along a, a, a line of sight where uh, space is, is expanding more than the average um, than the average direction, we expect to see an enhanced uh, value of the observed uh, Hubble parameter for this observer. Um, yes, we can also go to higher order and uh, realize that the um, that the higher order um, generalized cosmological parameters are also given in, in terms of truncated multiple series in the in the direction of the source E. 
um, and, uh, and uh, again uh, the coefficients uh, um, that that enter these multiple series are uh, um, are describing uh, physical properties of the uh, of the space time in terms of uh, local uh, kinematics and uh, curvature invariance. So properties that we are interested in, in knowing about in cosmology. And we can look at uh, uh, some uh, physical interpretation of uh, the hierarchy of multiples in the uh, deceleration parameter. So the, um, so the hierarchy of uh, multiples can be decomposed as, as, uh, as this. Uh, and um, and, and uh, this hierarchy of multiples uh, was in fact already derived in the uh, um, uh, in this nice PhD thesis by Ubina Ume. And we can look at some uh, physical uh, as, at physical interpretations of some of the terms that go into this uh, multiple decomposition. Uh, uh, the first term uh, here in the monopolar uh, contribution, it describes the uh, local acceleration of link scales in the observer frame. Uh, so this is also the interpretation of the um, FLW the, the, uh, deceleration parameter in the FLW limits, and it is uh, also the only non-vanishing uh, term in the strictly um, in the in the strictly homogeneous and isotropic limit. All other terms uh, here are due to uh, anisotropic and inhomogeneous uh, effects in the in the space time, and so we see that because we have this hierarchy of correction terms to the effective uh, de deceleration parameter as it enters in the luminosity distance cosmography, we can no longer uh, interpret um, the deceleration parameter as measuring the deceleration of link scales in the observer frame. Uh, and uh, this is an important uh, realization for uh, for model independent data analysis. I, I would say since uh, since um, uh, uh, since the values that we that we infer for the deceleration parameter as it enters in the luminosity distance uh, redshift relation is exactly what leads us to conclude uh, things about uh, acceleration of of space and uh, dark energy and so on in cosmology. And we can look at some uh, of the uh, correction terms that goes into go into this uh, hierarchy. Um, for instance, here we have a spatial gradient of the local expansion rate uh, entering. It tells us that if the observer is looking along a direction where uh, space is expanding more as we move away from the observer, we expect to see a positive contribution to the effective deceleration parameter. Uh, this is a very uh, natural contribution, you could say, and it's also a contribution uh, that we might expect to be dominant in realistic, uh, in realistic uh, cos uh, cosmological modeling, where um, where uh, we um, uh, we will uh, typically have that that uh, even though. Um, even though physical variables such as expansion rate and density contrasts might be bounded in their uh, in their uh, fluctuations, the, the the slope of the fluctuations might still be be, be steep, and so we we can have uh, spatial gradients of, of such physical uh, uh, variables uh, dominating, and so we might expect um, that the spatial gradients. Um, of kinematic variables in this hierarchy will, will dominate in the deceleration parameter. Uh, this is something that we can uh, test uh, with uh, cosmological data sets if these are large enough and have uh, good enough uh, sky coverage. Uh, it's also something that we can assess in uh, numerical simulations, uh, which is what I've been doing together with uh, Haley McPherson, who is an expert in uh, general relativistic simulations as applied uh, to cosmology. Uh, here we took a realistic uh, uh, cosmological large scale uh, simulations uh, simulation um, where we took the cosmological constant to, to zero for practical purposes, but uh, this 
uh, I don't expect to to um, to qualitatively change our our results. Um, and uh, we produced um, the cosmography for uh, individual ob observers uh, uh, placed in this uh, space time. And this is a picture of the sky of a typical obs observer of uh, this uh, simulation. Um, here we see um, so uh, here we see that the, the uh, effective uh, Hubble parameter of this observer's uh, uh, luminosity distance cosmography is um, its anisotropic uh, signature is dominated by a quadruple, which is expect exactly what we would uh, expect uh, from the from the theoretical uh, expression, where the local shearing of space is um, is giving a quadruple in the uh, in the effective Hubble parameter. When we go to the deceleration parameter, we see that we have a dipole dominating, and uh, we might also be able to see an octuple by i. And uh, this uh, is exactly what we would expect from this order of magnitude um, prediction from the previous slide. Um, and we have that for this uh, particular observer that the jerk parameter is dominated by a quadruple. This is also something that we might expect when we write down the uh, mathematical expression for the effective jerk parameter. Um, okay, so some intermediate uh, comments on uh, on uh, on these results on luminosity uh, distance um, since uh, the luminosity distance cosmography can be rep represented uh, in terms of a finite um, number of degrees of uh, freedom at at at, uh, at finite um, order in the in the cosmography um, it, it um, it is uh, possible to do model independent uh, analysis with uh, such expression. And uh, I think it opens the door for a lot of interesting analysis. Uh, I'm currently investigating uh, luminosity um, uh, distance uh, signals of artificial observers uh, within numerical simulations uh, together with uh, collaborators who are experts in uh, numerical simulations applied to cosmology. Uh, also, we want to, at some point, uh, start to look at uh, actual uh, cosmological data sets. Uh, and uh, for this, I'm doing a first uh, analysis with motivated uh, search for uh, anisotropies in uh, supernova data. And I do this together with uh, Antonin Bordier, who is um, a student at uh, Ines de Lyon, who I've been uh, supervising. And we do this together with our uh, collaborators at Cambridge. Um, yeah, so I will also talk a bit about redshift drift signals um, in uh, in cosmology. Uh, so here we can write uh, uh, yeah uh, the the redshift uh, drift, drift uh, signal for a general uh, congruence de description of observers and emitters. Uh, this is the exact result. So we we have not expanded in in redshift, um, in redshift uh, yet, uh, this is really just how the exact uh, signal uh, looks. And we see that uh, again, the FLW Hubble parameter generalized nicely into this uh, curly H function that we also saw uh, for the luminosity distance cosmography. Uh, but we, in addition, we have uh, this uh, additive term um, uh, S here, which is um, zero in the FLW uh, universe uh, models, uh, so it has no FLW counterpart, uh, and it represents anisotropies and inhomogeneities that are encountered uh, along uh, the photon path, along uh, uh, from from the emitter to the observer. And we can do some uh, algebra, algebra to uh, get an understanding um, uh, to, um, as to exactly uh, how uh, and isotropies and inhomogeneities uh, enter in uh, in this term. Uh, yeah, it also turns out that it is useful to write down the redshift drift signal um, as an integral functional, where the uh, integrant uh, pi here uh, reduces to the uh, local uh, acceleration of space in an FLW universe model. 
uh, but uh, in the generic case, um, the integrand takes a more complicated form and we can represent it again in a useful way in terms of a multiple decomposition in the uh, direct, uh, direction of the source on the observer sky E. But now we also have an additional, additional expansion variable entering, which is essentially the gradient of the uh, direction uh, of, the, of the source. Um, this complicates uh, the analysis a bit, but otherwise the spirit is, is uh, much the same as was the case for uh, luminosity distance. Uh, and the multiples that uh, go into this uh, series expansion are again, um, are again coefficients that uh, tells us something about uh, the local uh, kinematics of, of space and curvature invariance. Uh, we can look at the monopolar contribution here in which terms go, go into uh, this. Um, we have a rigid focusing a term which tells us how um, how observers in the space time are co converging under the forces of gravity. Uh, this is the only non vanishing term in the strict FLRW limit. And we have other terms here uh, entering, uh, which are interesting because they are norms of spatial vectors and uh, tensors. So these are, uh, and they, they come with a, a minus sign, so they contribute. Um, negatively to the monopolar contribution to the redshift drift signal. And so, uh, therefore, uh, uh, we have that uh, if we have uh, geodesic observers, uh, then um, for a, a positive rigid focusing uh, term, which uh, amounts to a sat satisfaction of the strong energy condition in general relativity, then we have that the monopolar contribution to the redshift drift signal is negative. Um, this in turn mean, uh, means that if we can, um, if, if the monopole contribution is dominant, dominant for, um, for long distances of uh, light propagation, uh, such that we can uh, ignore the higher, um, uh, uh, higher order a hierarchy of multiples, uh, then, uh, then we have that satisfaction of the strong energy condition uh, amounts to um, a negative, um, negative uh, redshift drift signals. And uh, this means that a positive detection of redshift drift is, uh, in this case, a, a direct uh, detection of strong energy condition uh, violation and in as a special case, uh, dark energy. And uh, this, I think, is a, 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 a very interesting result for cosmology, that we have uh, a plausible, plausible way of uh, probing uh, dark energy without having to uh, assume, uh, uh, make, um, make assumptions about uh, the exact nature of the underlying uh, geometry. Uh, okay, uh, I also have some results on how we might formulate a redshift drift cosmography for, for model independent uh, data analysis of uh, redshift drift, uh, but I might skip the details of, of this. Um, yeah. Um, but some uh, comments on, on a uh, redshift uh, drift are that uh, in, in general the redshift drift signal um, acquires non trivial contributions from structure along the photon uh, null paths um, and this and these contributions um, tend to be systematic and contribute uh, negatively to the to the redshift drift uh, signal um, this is at least what i've found in these first investigations and this, uh, this uh, makes redshift drift an interesting uh, plausible probe of a violation of the strong uh, energy condition. And this is, uh, uh, in fact, consistent with uh, numerical results in the literature on 
uh, on Redshift Drift, where um, for instance, uh, Sophie Coxbang has some very nice uh, papers uh, on this, and um, uh, where it, it seems that it is uh, uh, quite uh, difficult to produce a positive redshift drift uh, signal. Uh, in fact, the, the, the only examples I've, I've seen on, on this is are cases where, I, where exactly the, the, the strong energy condition is uh, violated. Um, and um, I also found that it's possible to uh, represent, uh, uh, to derive uh, derived useful uh, redshift drift uh, cosmographic uh, expressions. Um, and uh, currently I am uh, looking at how we might um, uh, uh, incorporate uh, local uh, motion effects in, the, in, um, in our prescription for drift measurements and, um, and distinguish these from uh, global cosmological effects. And I do this together with uh, Mikolai Kosinski at the University of Warsaw. Uh, he also has some uh, very nice, uh, nice uh, papers on drift effects in uh, cosmology, if you are uh, interested in, in this. Uh, and uh, I am also uh, working on uh, reducing the number of degrees of freedom that go uh, into these uh, cosmographic uh, expressions in order to uh, be able to, uh, uh, to apply them uh, to, um, uh, to, um, to, um, uh, to present cosmological data sets or near future cosmological data sets, and I do this uh, together with uh, Haley McPherson. Um, okay, so um, I would just like to stress that model independent uh, cosmological analysis of uh, distance uh, redshift data and redshift data is, is possible. Um, it requires sufficient data and uh, sky coverage. Uh, and this is uh, interesting in the light of uh, the, the fast uh, growing uh, cosmological uh, uh, surveys in the uh, data sets in these uh, years. Uh, for instance, we are going to have access to uh, hundreds of thousands of supernova of type 1a within this uh, decade uh, through existing surveys, but also through upcoming surveys such as LSST and ReFIRST. Um, we are also going to have access to entirely new cosmological measurements in the form of, form of uh, drift, uh, uh, drift measurements and the relative drift signals we uh, expect to be able to, uh, to, um, to measure within uh, two decades. Uh, until then, we might do constraint uh, analysis with uh, available uh, distance redshift data um, and um, and uh, we uh, are, uh, might also be interested in uh, looking at, uh, at light propagation and uh, cosmographies in, um, in a realistic uh, model universe uh, settings uh, for, for realistic, for realistic uh, observers. Uh, we also, there are also quite a lot of interesting things to develop on the theory side. Um, for instance, we want to look at uh, uh, other observables and how we might formulate uh, useful uh, cosmographies for, for these. We, we might also want to think about optimizing our cosmographic uh, expressions in various uh, ways to make them more adaptable to, uh, to actual uh, data analysis. And um, it's also interesting to look at forecasts for upcoming surveys. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther, for your very interesting talk. That was really cool. Uh, okay, so we are um, running short on time, but if you have a quick question, you can raise your hand now. We'll have time in the discussion after this. Okay, Maurice. Yeah, this is a, uh, a very, uh, fairly complete, uh, detailed framework to awaiting to be applied to data. And so I'm, I'm very intrigued and uh, basically I'm very um, curious if you are planning to, uh, you know, evaluate this approach by concrete examples. And obviously there will be data redshift limited as we have today, 
but you can still make a, a, an assessment as to what the promise will be if you vary over different ranges of redshifts. So are you considering doing that? Uh, yes, uh, I'm, I have, uh, so, so I'm currently working on, uh, on a first, uh, an analysis of, of this with, um, uh, using the joint light curve analysis uh, uh, sample together with Antonin Baudier and um, um, and, uh, uh, and Haley McPherson and uh, uh, Suhail Davan from the uh, University of Cambridge. Um, so, um, and here we are also looking at forecasts uh, on how uh, much it, Data we would need to, in order to uh, contain the the the, uh, the quadruple in the Hubble parameter, for instance, um, uh, for 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 uh, for various scales. Uh, also, I'm looking at uh, at uh, various uh, uh, model space times, both from the analytical perspective, but also in, in numerical simulations to, uh, uh, yeah, to, um, to, 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 uh, to uh, try to, uh, to um, come up with a better, uh, with, with some uh, numerical expectations for, for various model space times. And uh, I know that, uh, uh, Steven and Pratush Prano has, has also been have also been talking about uh, employing some of this uh, formalism for uh, SDSS, if I remember uh, correctly. So yep. I think, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Pavan, you have a question. But we, if we can save it to the discussion session, that would help me a lot. Please, sorry about that. Uh, so, okay, thank you again, Asta. So if you just stick around, we'll have a discussion at the end of the session. Um, okay, so the last talk in the session is Roger Klaus and Alexia Lopez. Um, so how is this going to work? Roger, are you here? Um, if we can swap halfway through. Um, we're, we're not in the same room. We're 30 miles apart. So okay, we swap, then I need to through. make Alexia... You are now correct. Okay, so when you're finished, then you can just stop sharing your screen and then uh, Alexia can uh, share hers. If you're going first, I don't know. Okay, can you see my screen okay? Uh, no. Wait. Is it okay? No, I can see you. I can't see your screen. No. Maybe. Again. Can you see it? No. Does it give you a message? Ah, okay. Yes. Is that showing now? It's showing, yeah. It's if you make it a uh, presentation. Is this? Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. So we have uh, two speakers, uh, Roger Klaus and Alexia Lopez. And Roger will speak first uh, on challenges to the standard cosmological model. So please, uh, you have 30 minutes in total between the two of you, Jose. Okay, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from Preston in the northwest of England. And thanks to the organizers who allowed Alexa and I to share this talk. So we'll do 15 minutes each, and I'll, I'll aim to finish a little before 15 minutes if I can. So this, the title is Potential Challenges to the Standard Cosmological Model. And challenges does not mean contradict, it just means challenges. And in the first half, I'm going to talk about large quasar groups, and Alexia is going to talk about her recent discovery of the giant arc. 
I should point out that the lecture is, is a research student and, and she's only about one third the way to her PhD program at the moment. So the outline of what I'll talk about is um, an introduction to large quasar groups. And then I'll say something about the Klaus Camposano large quasar group and the huge large quasar group. But the main point, the, the main area I want to talk about is, is some work by Tracy Friday. And Tracy uh, was a research student, um, but she's no longer in astronomy. So I, I want to tell you about her work. Damien alluded to it about an hour ago. And um, I hope I don't misrepresent her work. And then I'll just finish with a summary. So some history, history of large quasar groups. The first one was found by Adrian Webster in 1982 from the, the old Osman Smith Quasar Survey. And since he discovered the first one, I, I suppose he had an attempt at coining a name for it and called them super duper clusters. This is a name that didn't catch on, but if it had, we might now be talking about SDCs instead of LQGs. So I could quite have liked it if it had stayed as super duper clusters, but it didn't. The second large quasar group was found by Crampton, Cowley and Hartwick and reported in two papers, 1987, 1989. And at this time in, in the 1980s, structures on the scale of 100 megaparsecs were, were not being particularly well received by the community. People seem to think that such things were not possible in the standard cosmology. And then in 1991, Luis Camposano and I found the third LQG, which came, came to be known as the Klaus Camposano LQG. And then many years later, in 2013, we found the huge large quasar group. And some people don't like the, the reference to huge and large in one expression, but um, it has some amusement value. There are many LQGs known now, mostly because of the Sloan data. And the sizes go from 50 up to 500 megaparsecs and beyond. And the memberships go from five quasars up to 70 and beyond. And typically they're found by single linkage hierarchical clustering methods with some method for establishing um, something that we hope is related to their significance. And when analyzing them, we tend to put limits on the membership and the significance. So this, this picture shows the Klaus Camposano large quasar group and the huge large quasar group. In 1991, the CC LQG was the, the largest structure or the largest feature known in the universe. And then in 2013, the huge LQG was the largest structure or feature known in the universe. And the interesting thing is that these two largest structures in the universe are adjacent to each other on the sky. And not only that, they're at the same mean redshift. And as if you look at the RA deck, you'll see that these correspond roughly to various um, dipoles and axes of evil that people have been talking about. And there's even another LQG in the, in the foreground at um, the redshift of 1.11. And the scale is much larger than the Yadav et al claim scale of homogeneity, which is about 370 megaparsecs. So you can see, again, looking at the RA and deck, the dipole, the CMB dipole is quite close. The Sacrest et al dipole is a little further away. The picture on the right, showing the huge large quasar group here and the Klaus Camposano one down here, 
and we've we've been interested in whether they connect to each other but it seems we don't have much evidence for any connection between the two but if you look at this figure here this is showing magnesium 2 absorbers in the region there is at least a hint that the magnesium 2 absorbers show some sort of connection between them and people this morning asked in Damien's talk about some um, whether the polarization indicates something to do with the reality of the Quasar group and I'd refer you to Marinello et al 2016 which shows that the huge large Quasar group is you'd expect one like that in the Sloan survey if the Sloan survey was about five times larger. So it's, it's not impossible that the huge large Quasar group can occur. And this, to remind you, um, is a figure that Damien showed about an hour ago, showing the alignment of polarization vectors with the huge large quasar group and the Klaus Campesano large quasar group. So now, the main thing I want to talk about is this work by Tracy Friday, who, who was a PhD student here. She got a PhD last year. Uh, but she's no longer in astronomy. So you can find out more detail about this work by looking at a thesis, which is on the archive. And we've also just submitted the paper on this to monthly notices. And in part, the work was inspired by the work by what's what Semik was at L, um, 2005, 2014. And this led Tracy to ask, do large quasar groups, the largest structures that we know about, do they themselves correlate on gigaparsec scales? And this led to some unexpected, intriguing, and tantalizing results. And many of you will know that the word tantalizing is code for, while this is interesting, it's not going to be the gold standard five sigma results that people like to see. So this is a plot of 71 large quasar groups from, from my um, detection algorithms with a threshold significance set. They're in the redshift range one to 1.8. And the black crosses are the centers of three regions that were used by the Liège group. And the one A1 in the middle is the destination that Tracy used for parallel transport of the position angles. So the first thing that arose from Tracy's work is that the distribution of position angles is not uniform. And that's that hypothesis is, is rejected. And it's also bimodal. So you can see that there are two peaks. They're, they're essentially the same data. One of them, the one on the left up here is unweighted data. And the one on the right is weighted according to the um, orthogonal distance regression, goodness of bit. And in both cases, these are parallel transported to the center of the A1 region. In the bottom panel, Tracy did something a little different by parallel transporting the LQGs to each LQG in turn, and then taking the median of the stack of those results. And you, you can again see the, the bimodal distribution. And if you remember this, these two top figures in the next panel, this is just shown as a rose diagram. So the shaded bit on the left is just because of a convention that you reproduce the data on the other side. And I think these rose diagrams show the bimodality of the distribution of position angles quite well. And then next thing is that Tracy looked at whether the 
position angles were correlated from large quasar group to another. And I think this is a little bit too complicated to go into in detail at the moment, but you can look at Tracy's thesis. It's essentially using the S test from the Liège group and to summarize what it shows, it shows that the large quasar groups are themselves, their alignments are correlated in the sense of being either aligned with each other or orthogonal to each other over scales of about 30 degrees or something like 1.6 gigaparsecs at the, um, at the present epoch scale for the redshift of interest. So I'll try and finish just a little bit early, but here are the main points. The position angles are unlikely to be uniform. There's a bimodal distribution. And the angles for the bimodal distribution are remarkably similar to the angles found for the radio quasar polarizations that we heard about from, from Damien about an hour ago. So not only do LQGs themselves potentially challenge the cosmological principle just by virtue of sheer size, but you also have the fact that they appear to be either aligned parallel or orthogonal to each other across large scales. So what does this mean? Well, does it mean that the universe has some kind of cellular structure? Or does it mean a further challenge to the cosmological principle? Now, earlier I mentioned Gabriel Marinello's results that showed that the huge LQG could happen in standard cosmology if you increase the survey area by about a factor of five. But we looked at his simulations again, well, they're actually the Horizon 1 2 simulation, and there are no such alignment effects in the simulated large quasar groups. So, whatever was built into that cosmology. Um, although it can reproduce large quasar groups, it does not appear to reproduce these alignment effects. And then the, the slide, um, just to indicate that it's just about time to, for Alexi to take over, is Milne's 1933 statement of the cosmological principle or the extended principle of relativity, which if nothing else gives evidence that people in the 1930s might have had some tendency to write much longer sentences than they do today. So at that point, I'll stop and hand over to Alexia. Thank you, Roger. So if you could stop sharing your screen. There we go. Okay, Alexia. Okay. Um, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah, we can see. Yeah. So if you make it a. Uh... Okay. Okay, thanks. Please okay, stop. So, uh, yeah. Thanks, Roger. Um, and as, as Roger was saying, um, I'm going to do a little talk on um, the recent discovery of the giant arc in the sky. Um, I am uh, just a PhD student at the moment. This is my first invited talk. So thank you for that. It's quite exciting. Um, so yeah, uh, giant arc on the sky. Um, sorry if you can hear the leaf blower outside, by the way, I live on a main road. 
Um, so this is just a quick overview on what I'll talk about. Um, I'll only dip into a little bit on the background because I'm pretty certain everyone in the audience is familiar with uh, the cosmological principle and large scale structure. And so I'll go into the method of detection, the discovery of the giant arc, some statistical properties and observational properties, and I'll finish with a summary and a quick look at some future work possibly as well. And so as we're all pretty much aware, the foundations of the uh, standard model of cosmology is built upon the assumption of the cosmological principle. So this leads to a necessity uh, to assess this assumption looking at real data. So generally speaking, we can test the isotropy by looking at CMB maps, and we can test homogeneity by looking at the large scale matter distribution. Uh, the latter here, observing uh, large scale matter distribution is no small task. Um, just for starters, we need really powerful telescopes, enough telescope time, whether we're looking at wide fields or deep fields. Uh, there's also pros and cons with both photometry and spectroscopy. Um, and also the intrinsic problem of looking at distant objects means we're viewing earlier times. So how can we be sure that something will, how something will look now if we're looking so far into the past? And we can calculate how things might look, um, but we do this using the current standard model, uh, which is what we're trying to establish is a working theory. So it's actually quite a tricky circular problem. Um, yeah, so uh, this is just a few examples of some of the very large scale structures that exceed the scale of homogeneity. And um, so the giant arc is the fourth largest large scale structure. And together, all these structures um, raise important questions for the validity of the cosmological principle. And um, so the method we use to assess large scale structure is of intervening magnesium to absorption systems in the spectra of quasars. And um, so the schematic here um, is showing, so these are representing the, the yellow stars are representing the quasars and the blue galaxy looking things are representing the uh, galaxy halos, uh, the low ionized gas around galaxy halos. So as the quasar light travels, um, from distant space across the universe, um, some of the light is absorbed. And in particular, the magnesium-2 absorption doublet feature is very prominent and distinctive and is indicative of star formation regions. Um, so that's why it makes a particularly good tracer of uh, the large scale structure. Um, so we use the data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, so the DR7 and DR12 quasar databases, containing around 120,000 quasars. And following this, independent authors have catalogued the magnesium to absorption systems in these quasars, of which there are around 64,000. Um, we then use these magnesium two catalogs to then assess the large scale structure. Um, the magnesium two catalogs present both accurate spectroscopic redshifts and also the sky coordinates, which allows us to map the large scale structure in finer detail than seen previously. And um, so this here is the giant arc. So it's a serendipitous discovery. Uh, I made it when I was testing the magnesium two method in my MSC. Uh, I was looking at known and documented clusters. And um, in particular, I was looking at an SZ cluster. And when I looked at this in the magnesium two, I saw this hint of a dense band of magnesium two absorbers. So since then I've refined the details a little, I expanded the field of view, and that's how I stumbled across the giant arc. And um, so the figure here is showing the gray contours is the smooth and flat fielded magnesium two absorbers. And um, the dots in the background, which are actually dark blue, but very faint, so you probably can't see that. These are the background quasars. And um, the central redshift is approximately 0.8, and um, scaled in uh, present epoch proper size, the giant arc extends approximately one gigaparsec. And um, so some statistics. So uh, the first test is an MST type test. And um, so 
It's a sequence of applying the single linkage hierarchical clustering and the convex hull of member spheres. The SLHC is equivalent to the MST when separated at a specified linkage scale. And it breaks up the uh, field into groups and clusters. And then the convex hull of member spheres works by drawing a unique volume around the groups and clusters identified. Um, and then a significance of clustering and a over density is calculated um, from the convex hull, the unique volumes uh, compared to expected density. And so here in this figure, we can see that the MST type test actually broke the giant arc or what we visually identified as the giant arc into two portions. So one really large portion, which is very significant 4.5 sigma, and then a much smaller segment. Um, because the magnesium two absorbers do rely on background quasars, um, conceivably, if we had one more background quasar, possibly we could have one more magnesium two absorber, which could connect the whole thing as a giant structure. Um, so the PSA calculates the statistic by testing for clustering on some scale, say lambda C, by considering the Fourier modes with wavelength greater than lambda C. So the six high peaks here show the significant clustering on approximately 230 megaparsec scales, which likely corresponds to the width of the giant arc. And finally, the Kuzikin Edwards test, which is actually used mostly in medical research. So it was quite a new, uh, it was quite new applying it in an astrophysical sense. Um, it's a case control K nearest neighbors test that assesses the clustering of the magnesium two absorbers with respect to the background quasars. So this is a very important feature and probably something we should we should use similar techniques to this going forward when assessing uh, the significance of the giant arc. Um, but each of the three tests can offer something quite different. So they're all assessing different aspects of the giant arc. So it's important to take all three tests as a, a group, as an accumulative group uh, for assessing the giant arc. Um, okay, so some observational properties. So the first thing we did was have a look at the DR16Q quasars in the same redshift slice as the magnesium two absorbers. And um, so here in this figure, the gray contours are the magnesium two absorbers as usual, and the blue contours are the DR16Q quasars. So I'm just going to stress that these quasars are the ones that are in the same redshift slice as the magnesium two absorbers. So we're no longer looking at the background quasars. Um, and we tentatively um, say that possibly there could be an association between these two. Um, if there is such an association, we do believe it could indicate something of the environment of the giant arc. Um, so yeah, that's just here. We kind of see this blue contour, possibly following the gray contour, something that we should look further into. Um, other observational properties. So we binned the equivalent widths, the strengths of the equivalent widths um, and color coded them. So the lightest color is the weakest equivalent width and the darkest, uh, the darkest color is the strongest equivalent width. And um, so generally what we find is that there might be uh, more stronger absorbers on the left hand side. Um, and there's a couple up here as well, but in particular, this little middle section here, um, and I am just going to go back up just a couple of slides quickly to um, this one. Okay, so I just want you to have a look at this little gap here. Okay, this little gap in, in, in the middle of the giant arc. And remember that the discovery of the giant arc was made when looking at an SZ cluster. So here we have a slight gap in the giant arc, which seems to be encircled by strong magnesium two absorbers. Um, and the fact that there's an SZ cluster, we know for a fact there's an SZ cluster in the middle here. And we suggest that there's possibly these th three things are all linked together. Like maybe for instance, what I mean to say is the SZ cluster is related to the fact that there's a gap in the giant arc or the fact that there seems to be a strong 
um, strong absorbers encircling this. It's uh, speculative at the moment, but anything we can do to understand the environment of the giant arc will benefit understanding how it formed and how it evolves, etc. Um, yes, yeah, so of course the question, was it all mean? And um, so as I've just mentioned then, strong magnesium two absorbers, an SZ cluster in the middle and a slight gap, are they all connected? Do they all indicate something about the, the environment of the giant arc? Um, similarly, the association of magnesium two absorbers with the quasars, um, the more other data we look at as independent corroboration with the giant arc, the more we can possibly understand about the environment, um, which is quite important. It's the newest and one of the largest large scale structures in accumulating set. Um, and together, all of these large scale structures um, are, are potentially bringing a challenge to the cosmological principle. As Roger was saying earlier, just one on its own isn't necessarily a problem, but it's the fact that there is an accumulated set of large scale structures which at the moment aren't necessarily described or understood in our current standard model. Um, and finally, just a little speculative thing here, the giant arc seems to have some similarities to the Sloan Great Wall in that it's, it's thin, it's long, it's filamentary, um, and possibly um, the giant arc is actually twice as big as the Sloan Great Wall though, but obviously the Sloan Great Wall is in our near redshift universe and the giant arc is at um, a redshift of 0.8, so um, possibly the giant arc could be something of a precursor to the Sloan Great Wall, maybe something interesting to look at. Um, so yeah, just quickly on some future work, obviously we'll have a look at the rest of the Magnesium 2 catalogue. We've only viewed a small percent of it so far, um, but to do this, we'll probably need an objective uh, filament or pattern finder. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it would be better if we could use something like the Kuzik and Edwards or like the flat fielding, where it takes into account the uneven distribution of background quasars. Um, we're gonna continue looking at other data for independent corroboration and anything we can learn about the environment, um, especially with the equivalent width um, distribution, it's it's already been it's spoken about how the equivalent width of a magnesium two absorber can indicate things about the galaxy morphology or impact parameter of galaxy inclination, luminosity, et cetera, et cetera. So the more we can understand about the equivalent widths, what they mean, or anything else about the environment, be it other data, et cetera, the more we can understand about the giant arc. Um, so yeah, I feel like I haven't taken a breath yet. Um, <laughs> so it's just a quick summary. Um, so a one gigaparsec giant arc of magnesium two absorbers at a redshift of 0.8, three statistical tests greater than three sigma, um, potentially causing a challenge to the cosmological principle. Um, a tentative association of the giant arc with quasars in the same field and a quick look at some of the observational properties, in particular the equivalent width, indicates some potentially interesting things to look at in the future. And um, yeah, that's me. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alexi. Uh, very nice talk and finished right on time. So uh, we have uh, time for questions. So any questions for Roger or Alexia, first of all? Raise your hand if you have a question or post it in chat. Okay, uh, Maurice. Yeah, I would like to bring up for discussion the, this question following up on George Mook's uh, comment yesterday that, you know, many, if you like, apparent symmetries are perhaps approximate symmetries because they are emergent. And so the cosmological principle may be one of them. But then uh, it depends on, uh, or depending on what you are observing as being uh, subject to that supposed supposed symmetry, uh, it may come with different length scales and or time scales. For instance, you know, you might indeed expect a matter distribution homogenization to uh, appear on one scale. And you might then uh, expect something like a vector quantity, like uh, polarization or some orientation 
uh, to appear on another scale because simply vectors are not the same as scalars. Uh, and so I'll be curious if one can perhaps uh, infer from observations the ratio or, or, or estimate the ratio of those, uh, uh, what I would expect, different scales uh, across which uh, things would uh, basically turn over to uh, homogeneous or, and or isotropic. Or should I rephrase my question? Or? Um, is this question for me? Or yeah, for, for you and, uh, and Roger, I guess, yeah, I mean, Okay. Well, I, I can address it to you. It will be interesting to hear what what you what your thoughts yeah, are. No, yeah. no. I was I was just trying to fully understand what the question was. <laughs> so, well, this this, this um, apparent uh, homogeneity and isotropy uh, uh, will appear at some scale, but that scale may depend on the nature of the quantity that you are uh, considering. Like obviously, uh, matter density uh, is is one first candidate, and then. Uh, a vector quantity like uh, polarization uh, may appear on a different scale, maybe even larger. Because oh, it's see. fundamentally a different quantity from a geometrical point of view, you know, vector versus scalar. Yeah, okay, I, I, get, I get that now, but I don't think it's my expertise to particularly answer this question. So if Roger, you wanna take over. <laughs> well, I, I don't think this is my area either, but I think what, what's needed is some somebody to define at what scale um, they would accept a challenge to the cosmological principle. And as I said, in the 1980s, people were not happy with structures on the scale of 100 megaparsecs when they were being found by Webster and Crampton et al. So that was regarded as um, something that couldn't happen. So now we're up to a gigaparsec or two gigaparsecs in the case of the GRB rings, um, I, I think we, we could do with some definition in advance of what scale people would accept that there was a challenge to the cosmological principle. Yeah, I mean, I. I... My question is suggesting that there may be a slightly different way of formulating this problem, because at what scale, essentially, that refers to a scale across which things tend to converge, but of course, never exactly reach, you know, ideal homogeneity and isotropy. But uh, evidence for this would then uh, could be supported from multiple channels if indeed there is a quantifiable ratio between those two scales for fundamentally different, geometrically speaking, different quantities. If, if I could uh, interject here, please. I think what you are uh, perhaps driving at is that there could be, in principle, a description of phenomena in cosmology uh, akin to the renormalization group that is used as you know, for statistical systems. Yeah, I'm definitely much. referring to some normalization. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So the idea there is that you have a description of phenomena on different scales, averaged on different scales, and that they are connected analytically by the renormalization group flow. And this uh, principle, of course, has seen great success. Uh, for example, in description of non-abelian gauge theories and so on. Yeah. Uh, now, the point is that something like that, um, uh, as far as I know, has not been formulated or attempted in cosmology, where, of course, the problem is much more difficult and harder to phrase. There may possibly have been some attempts in the old literature that I'm not aware of. But something like that is perhaps along the lines of what you are driving at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the point is that I know yesterday George Moore did su suggest that, uh, you know, these could be dynamical symmetries and so on, emergent, all that stuff. The point is that there is a very precise meaning of what a dynamical symmetry is when you are talking about, a, uh, for example, a Lagrangian in field theory. It's, it's you know, very precisely uh, stated and the uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking or hiding uh, the fact yeah. that the vacuum uh, 
uh, may not respect the symmetry, but the Lagrangian does. These are all very precisely uh, formulated mathematical statements. Uh, whereas here, I think, well, at least I personally haven't quite got my head around how one might uh, formulate those statements, uh, how one can uh, define a, a, a symmetry that is a property of the underlying Lagrangian, but not of the actual state of the universe, as it were. Yeah, yeah, that, exactly. Yeah. That I not quite get my head around yet. But I, I completely agree with you that one should think about these things. Uh, but actually, could I ask a question of this, of the, about this uh, LQGs, please? Uh, I'm sorry to butt in, but Alexia or Roger, could you answer a question, please? Uh, okay. Which is, uh, you have obviously now done uh, some st sophisticated statistical tests to check for uh, how rare these systems are. And you gave three examples which approach the problem from three different directions. And uh, because your point is simply that uh, different tests are all indicating that this is worth looking at seriously. And I think we all agree with that. But looking forward, uh, I, you did not say very much about what future uh, uh, results might hold. That is to say, uh, at what point do you think there'll be a breaking point where we can say that this kind of rare event is simply not uh, acceptable any longer in terms of a chance fluctuation? I mean, it's five sigma is just a benchmark, Roger. I mean, like we use it in frequentist tests in laboratory experiments. But in cosmology, um, depending on how big the stakes are, one might have to be a little more flexible in defining what is really the breaking point, if you see what I mean. Roger? Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering how to answer that. Um, we're a little bit limited from the data point of view, I think, and that the the more recent Sloan surveys have uh, intrinsic inhomogeneities in the survey, the, the way to conduct it. And I think that's going to make it hard for us to make a great deal of progress on that, um, unless we find a way of statistically dealing with um, surveys that have intrinsic difficulties. And Alexia was alluding to that by um, the Kozik Edwards test, for instance, which a test that comes from medical statistics, but it, it attempts to deal with variations in the population. So I think to make any great further progress um, moving on beyond the Sloan DR7 uh, data, we, we might need to um, look into statistical methods further, I think. What about LSST? What about e Rosita? What about uh, DAISY? All the forthcoming large data sets with spectroscopic redshifts, hopefully. Yeah, in many yes. cases. Hopefully they, they'll, um, they'll make contributions in a few years. Yes, they're not there yet, um, but... So in the immediate future, uh, uh, one doesn't really have uh, I mean, you know, that's what I was really asking. I mean, can we sort this out in the next two, three years? And the answer seems to be not quite. I think the Magnesium 2 approach, which we're following up now, has a lot of potential. The way we used to do things was to look for large quasar groups and then look for corroboration um, with Magnesium 2. Yes. But I think this, this approach of looking at the Magnesium 2 partly because it applies when the quasar number density is going down, um, gives us an opportunity to develop things further. Yes. But as Alexis said, we're, we're still in the early stages with this. This, this uh, giant arc cropped up rather early and we've, we've only looked at a small fraction of the data so far. So in the yes. short term, I think we can probably make some good progress that's good and it's in any case a great result to have in your phd thesis as alex does so congratulations thanks thanks guys thanks everyone um pavan you have a question 
uh, I had the same question as uh, Shubhri and others asked, like, what is the uh, scale at which we are going to start saying that, okay, now we have a confirmation with our, with our non-confirmation non with the cosmological principle. Uh, so, I mean, where does this 100 megaparsec initially and then 200 and then perhaps 300 is coming from? At least that other it all uh, paper, it was probably a numerical simulation which had about a scale of uh, 400 megaparsec or so. So, is it that just that we are going to just keep shifting the go shifting this uh, scale by I mean, whenever you find new data, or is it some coming from somewhere because the simulations also uh, need to a lot of things in these uh, uh, Hubble size uh, simulations. And in turn, I would like in turn I connect it to what she again said that uh, beyond at that scale where we are going to say it's okay. So there we have to see like extreme statistics or something like that where it's okay to have that one extreme anomaly. Uh, is my question clear? I'm not sure if it is. Um, on my end, it was breaking up a little bit. I couldn't quite hear the, the question. Ah, oh, sorry. Uh, so, I mean, I asked the same question as uh, we didn't others for asking, like, when, when are we going to stop saying that, okay, it's now confirmed with cosmological principle, what is the scale? Or is it scale being pushed as more observations are coming up? Like, for example, from older textbooks, it's like 100 megaparsec, and somewhat newer ones will be 200, 100 to 200, and then cosmological simulations say it is 400 megaparsec, and so on. Now it is one gigaparsec. We are, we are finding very extremely large structures. And um, so if I've understood correctly, because it's, it's quite like correctly on this end, um, I suppose you're trying to ask the same question as before is what you, is what you said um, about at what point are we going to be like, this is the set scale and or th this is the amount of structures we have. So like, where's the cutoff point, I think, is what you're trying to ask. Yeah. Um, to which my understanding is, um, I think that's I think that's the main question is at the moment in 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 my limited knowledge and opinion um it's that uh we keep adding to this set of large scale structures they keep getting bigger and bigger and alongside at the same time as Roger suggested so does this scale of homogeneity um and it's almost like we, the, the bigger the structures we find, the more we're finding evidence that, oh, well, actually the, the scale of homogeneity is this bigger, it's, it's getting bigger, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think in the work of theoretical cosmology is where we need to come up with a model, not saying that the standard model is co completely wrong at all, but meaning to say that I think it's time now that we start trying to ad ad adjust the standard models to allow for these large scale structures. Because one of the main things we always see is that large scale structures and this many of them don't quite fit into the cosmological principle or don't quite fit into the standard model. So I don't see why we should keep waiting for this, this kind of moment of, okay, yeah, these don't fit in. Maybe it's time we slightly adjust the, this, this standard model or, or possibly there is a way to justify these large scale structures. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think that's like, I don't think there's a final answer on that or at least I, I don't think there is a final answer on like at what point, because I think it's like now. <laughs> Now we should start think, thinking, you know. I had a pop-up question on that in the sense that do we get informed about this uh, scale of homogeneity from now, at least now, uh, through numerical simulation? So how well, how good are they? That is another question to understand. I didn't quite hear that. Sorry. I, my volume or something used to be just shocking. Could you maybe uh, type? Type the question in on the chat because the, the sound. I mean, we are we, we our information. I mean, our understanding of this the cutoff scale or homogeneity scale of homogeneity comes from 
at least we are informed through now uh, through simulations so how good the simulations are also is something that we need to understand no i don't quite is is yeah is there any chance you could write yeah, you write your question in chat Pavel, yeah oh, okay and then they can be answered so the the discussion session is now open to all of the speakers uh, in the afternoon so uh, if you have any questions at all please raise your hand so dominic uh, you had a question Yes, I, I actually wanted to uh, ask a question to Asta, but before that, let me just mention on the discussion we just had that I think maybe, because we, we discussed uh, what, what would be the next step, what would be the next survey, maybe the VFLOFA survey might be useful for uh, looking at these things, which will produce a million spectroscopic redshifts on radio selected uh, objects. So I guess that, uh, and it will start in June next year if the volcano has stopped by that time. Uh, so um, that might be something to look at in the future. So, but my question to Asta would be, um, what do you, do you think it's a problem um, that an expansion in redshift uh, does not converge beyond redshift of one? And um, I mean, the, we, we know that the convergence radius in, in the expansion and redshift is at most one, right? And so, so for, for what range of redshift would you expect that your formalism would work? So something like 0 0.2, 0 0.3, what, what, what is, uh, did, you, did you do any, some, some kind of estimates on? Yes, uh, so this is a, a, a good uh, question, which I think is very like, uh, central uh, yeah, for, for applying the formalism. So, um, so, so then if, if uh, the FLRW geometric setting it convergence um, properties and level of approximation of the Taylor series is um, well, well studied. Uh, and uh, you're right that there is a natural uh, there, uh, uh, there, there is a natural um, radius of, of, of convergence of, of uh, a redshift of, of uh, one here because there's a, uh, there's a there's a singularity in the in the complex plane at, at a redshift of of, uh, of minus one. So so the radius of, of, of convergence sure. is naturally one. And and um, we want to, of course, then understand this better when we go to the when we go to the general case. Um, and um, yeah, in, in in principle, you would you would need to test these things with particular. Uh, um, okay, I'm hearing myself as an echo. It's a bit. Annoying. Okay, but uh, in principle, you would have to test this uh, for the uh, for the particular uh, case that you that you have in mind. But but this is this is very much linked also to the to the scale of the congruence description that you are applying. Say, if you have a congruence description that's uh, that's very fine grained, um, so you expect the uh, you expect a, a truncated Taylor series expansion to, to uh, fail in approximating uh, the, the actual luminosity distance redshift signal, for instance, quite, quite quickly, just because you have a very oscillating function that you are trying to approximate with a polynomial. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it, this question is, is very much linked to the it, to the scale of your congruence description, uh, I've looked at uh, these questions um, in in the numerical simulations uh, together with uh, Heidi McPherson, where we considered a, a large-scale congruence descriptions, and uh, here, um, yeah. So this this is this is our on in our paper on this, but uh, here we essentially found that for co-screening, for large-scale congruence uh, descriptions of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of 
100 or, 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 or 200 megaparsec smoothing uh, scale. Here we had um, here we had the that the cosmography was a, 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 um, a, a, was approximately valid up to redshifts of 0.1. Okay, so uh, yeah, th th this really depends on uh, of your smoothing scale. Um, of, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah well, thanks a lot. Yeah. Question. Thanks, Esther. Thank you. So, uh, Maurice, you have a question? Uh, yeah, my question is for David Wiltshire. Uh, slide number 12 that you showed. And on slide number 12, you mention, uh, you give a little sketch with various um, scales, but I'm a bit surprised you didn't mention the cosmological horizon. Is there a reason why you don't explicitly bring that into the game? David Wiltshire, are you there? Yes, uh, I, 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 I am here and I'll try and find okay. slide 12. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was, it, you, you printed it very small, but I noticed it was 12 out of 40. I'm like, okay, that's perhaps useful. 12 out of 37, yeah. Uh, oh. um, okay. So, um, I'll just share the screen here. Um, Cosmological horizon anywhere in your talk, anyway, but um, it seems like no, no. It, it, okay. is on, it is on the background, but somehow um, you stay away from that. So maybe you Are can you sure, explain. Are you sure, it's slide twelve. We're talking about finite. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, right. So. Okay, so, so there's different horizons, and the one I'm talking about here is the one that George Ellis also calls the matter horizon. So in the primordial plasma, of course, things are limited by both the speed of sound and the speed of light. And since light has a finite propagation distance, then actually what's most important for the matter density is the speed of sound. Okay, so... Uh, George has a long, beautiful stuff about finite infinity, and the, the point is that the actual contribution to the energy density in gravitational waves or electromagnetic radiation is very tiny at the present epoch. What's most important are density perturbations, but density perturbations relate to non-propagating degrees of freedom. So that's an important thing <laughs> Um, in GR from the foundations that you distinguish between non-propagating degrees of freedom and propagating degrees of freedom. So um, the so the the, the uh, so I'm only talking about the observable universe as a whole. Uh, and when I'm talking about finite infinity, the uh, relevant um, you know. Uh, thing there is basically set by the sound horizon, which is close to the BAO scale, you know, not exactly. Uh, so that is why that one is important as opposed to um, the present epoch um, um, particle horizon, if that's the one you're thinking about. Right, but all of this is in the language of classical physics, you know, matter and so forth, um, essentially um, BAO talk. And, I, I might, and when you talk about dark energy, of course, at that point, we don't know whether we talk classical or low energy quantum cosmology. Right. So at, uh, that, so point, at that point, I would not be inclined to first think about sound horizon. I would be inclined to think about you know, the, the causality of the underlying space time in the language of, you know, what kind of slicing would allow you to define some Hilbert space for your fields. So it's a very different language. Uh, but, but actually causality is very, um, so, so yes. So the, the, the question is to what extent is um, 
the underlying geometry of geometries determined uh, by quantum cosmology and what at what level does that become a statistical thing which is uh, effectively classical so we treat i mean the, the all our usual description of cosmology is assuming that it is very classical and so what i'm is, what i'm interested in here is um late epochs and the consequences of having density perturbations which are the i mean which are uh, you know the, the most important thing is is the actual density fluctuation which is non-propagating just because it dominates over everything else so um so well yes there is a geometry of geometries so i mean the, the i mean uh but yeah i'm not <laughs> uh th th this this isn't intended to be um you know reasonably classical at this point i'm not yeah that was my impression yeah yes yeah, maybe we can follow up. I, mean, I would certainly like to follow up on this, maybe through a different channel, not to take too much yeah. time. Okay. Um, you know, what if there is a complementary view where the cosmological horizon in its own right would be relevant to the background space time? But anyway, let's, um, if you're open to it, let's uh, discuss it. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it's not going to be solved in one or two sentences. So, no. Just a quick comment. Uh, there is no DSCFT correspondence. There is an ADSCFT correspondence. In other words, uh, uh, the attempts to have some kind of a infrared ultraviolet link, which is what you're alluding to, has not cannot be realized for any Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker cosmology. This has been attempted and shown not to uh, even get off the starting block. So I think for the moment, the classical description that uh, David is talking about is quite adequate uh, for the point under discussion. We, uh, well, no, my, my point is that David also brought in dark energy in his talk, and that's uh, where uh, well, I'm rid of it. I feel there is a, you know, a, a potentially different angle uh, <laughs> of interest. Yeah, uh, no, yeah. No, I, so, well, so I'm, I'm, worries, I'm, worries. I'm, I'm claiming to get rid of it, though, so. Exactly, uh, exactly. Okay, if you hadn't noticed. <laughs> Some people... No, 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 no. That, that, that's fine, that's fine. We, you know, multiple angles are, are needed to zoom in. Uh, but anyway, it's because you brought up dark energy that although you claim to get rid of it, that I f feel there is room for a discussion on the cosmological horizon. Anyway, as I said, yeah, I, suggested, yeah, I, I would like to no, I mean, follow I, up. Yeah, so, 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 certainly that, you know, I mean, the, the thing, I mean, the, I accept the phenomenology of inflation, even though I don't think it's a fundamental theory. It's it's a phenomenology looking for a, a, a fundamental theory, uh, and it's very easy to get. But the, the the basic things in any successful thing of the early universe is that there is some sort of scale invariance, and then it's the, the, so that is. <laughs> Uh, so, so, so why why do we have a universe which is so close to being um, homogeneous and isotropic, but isn't? Uh, so, uh, I, I think that that has to come out of you know that does involve the geometry of geometries, but um, we shouldn't anchor it to a global split of space and time in the way that we you know draw, draw these. Um, Hyper, I mean, it's, it's fine to have an effective hypersurface, but uh, the actual scale on which Einstein's equations apply as causal evolution equations, given that the, the, the most important thing is the, the local density, is actually very, very small. So it's a big stretch um, to, to assume that it, Friedman applies on any scale of averaging in some exact sense that I can exactly split matter and geometry. As soon as you're coarse graining geometry, you're not dealing with the coarse graining of matter. And that's the that's that's the real issue. I mean, it's when the you know, so 
you know, we've had heard a lot of things about model independent, th model independent cosmography, et cetera, but that is, of course, as long as a dust approximation doesn't break down, but it does. So that's the thing we have to deal with. Actually, David, I had a question related to one of your slides. You seem to have some prediction for lambda CDM, right? Where we would expect a breakdown on lambda CDM. You showed some plot, and I think it was C equals 0.8 or... Uh, the, because okay. Maurice asked a question about a slide. I... Yep. Can you um, tell us about that again? Like, is it a concrete prediction or... Yeah, this is the clarkson bassett Lou test, so... Um... Can you give us a redshift and... Yep. Oh, uh, oops, we'll bring up. And are there any observations to support this at the moment? Um, well, Dis discrepant, <laughs> discrepant BAO, for example. <laughs> uh, so, um, okay, let me, whoops, uh, Clarkson Bassett Blue test, right. So, um, okay, uh, right. So, if so, the the idea in, in the standard model, space expands rigidly, in the sense that we can write the the curvature parameter um, uh, at the present epoch is something which is the same everywhere so you basically what you're doing is you're getting you're saying that how even though matter and geometry are locally coupled which is what they are in einstein's theory somehow when we average over everything it will expand as if the curvature of space on average is the same everywhere and that is the thing that um any model of strong back reaction will dispute. So um, in my approach or in anyone's approach, the universe, which is not FLRW, the universe is uh, void dominated at light, late times. That's a negative spatial curvature. It's just, and that's perfectly consistent with the sound horizon thing, because you, when you're looking, measuring, saying you're measuring spatial curvature um, from the, uh, CMB peaks, it's assuming that the spatial curvature is the same everywhere. So it, you can look at that rigid expansion in terms of any of an H of Z and a D of Z, where this is the effective co-moving scale. So of course, these are dressed parameters. So I've got bare parameters and dressed parameters. And uh, anybody's model will violate the clarkson bassett Lou test if it doesn't um, if space does not expand rigidly on average. Right? So, um, so this is in fact not the best way to do the test because, so I, I quantified this first in my, in a paper in 2009. Uh, and if I was, uh, I've got, I, I haven't put on all my extra slides on here, but uh, if I was doing it, I'd just look at the numerator and uh, not the denominator, because um, in general, as they've done it here, it, it will blow up. So there's better ways to do this observationally, which I discussed in 2009, but the people who've gone and looked at it since just took the original statistic, the test statistic. So Sapone, Majoretto and Neseris have done the projections. I, I'm not a observational person. Uh, I know that Arman Shafilu is interested in these things, and this might have been updated, but um, so um, uh, there are a lot of it. Yeah. So these diagnostics are very common, David, right? So this, yes. I guess, is another diagnostic, you know. So this is a good, so, so, so many diagnostics, um, so there are things like this. Chris is here. Form. Yeah, this is, <laughs> the, the, so this is a diagnostic which, uh, is set up to falsify the Friedman equation, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, I, I, I have a, a prediction of, of when it should be falsified uh, over a particular range of redshift. And I'm happy that Dragon is going to take up my um, 
take up a wager with me. That's that's great. So I mean, it's, you know, so if if Friedman is 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 satisfied uh, at this level of of, of you know, I, I'm happy to go away and. Wait, resign. David, on that, can can we also join your wager, right? So there's these Susie wagers. Well, I, I right? can't. I I don't. <laughs> it sounded very interesting, right? <laughs> so you should open the, it to everybody, not just you and Dragon, right? Well, I you, you but the, I, I I might make myself ba bankrupt if I. Bank <laughs> no, no, no. Not, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, well, well I'm, I'm I'm happy for anyone. We should discuss this. We should discuss this. this. We, we can we can, we can discuss that offline. That's that's great. But any anyway, so so the, so the point so. I mean, I do have a lot of concerns about how the data is reduced, as as we said in discussion earlier, and uh, you know the um, uh, yeah, it's um, uh, right, you know. So okay, but, but between yeah. point five and one, we expect some deviation, right? Is that it? Yeah. So 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 things like this in the in the Pantheon survey that you know the the salt two is, is modified mm -hmm. all this. I mean you, you need you need to do things without all of this um in body you know the modified trip formula because what we saw when I did the analysis with Aster and and folks with and uh, so so we when we do so we look for a scale of statistical homogeneity and when we fit um the salt two thing to the timescape and another number of different things and we just cut out data, um, then we see independent a model that there is a, a drop um, at what we would say is a scale of statistical homogeneity. And this was independent of Lambda CDM or timescape. I mean, matter. there are some things in, in supernovae that are well documented. So basically, like Adam cuts at all uh, supernovae below 0 0.0233. And essentially, because there's a well-documented Hubble bubble, right? There's a, a, which I think Subir, Subir has attributed to Shapley, right? Or somebody has attributed to Shapley, so or so something, that, something, some low, that local exactly cluster. Right. So that those are precisely the the issues that are important because mm -hmm. people in in Pantheon, etc., people use data below that scale. So, um, and the, the the my concern was that when when they went to um, Pantheon, uh, then there were 95 supernova which are not there anymore. And when we redo the analysis, suddenly an effect of the scale of statistical homogeneity goes away. So did you did you ask Dan what happened to them? Uh, no. <laughs> um, okay, I, I assume it's something to do with the light curves and the light curves not being very good okay. or. Yeah. So so well 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 yeah. But that's it. The, the the problem is the light curves are not good when we um, <laughs> do this sort of analysis. That's that's no, the problem. I think as we get better data, I think we can be more selective, right, about the light curves, and some stuff gets thrown away, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But but you have to be very careful when 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 you're putting in the standard model into. So anyway, I I mean, I yeah. So so. Um, you know, we, you know, so so there's a lot of things that go on, I and mean, we we can, I mean, uh, I've got m much more problems about. Um, so we can extract a BAO. I mean, I've done that. So, I mean, Aster did that, uh, but I, I, I'm sure at, at the moment there are too many uncertainties because we can't, we don't have a, a way of doing back reaction in the early universe, and, and although you might think it's small. Then it is small, but if it's not exactly FLIW, then okay. actually okay. that propagates to uh, a large uncertainty today. Okay, good. Chris, Chris, you're here, right? This is yes. Chris. Um, yeah, hi. Um, I just wanted to um, pick up um, something you said, David, um, about back reaction. Um, yeah. There have been there a number of um, relativistic simulations um, which don't start particularly from an ansatz of zero back reaction, but they don't see large back reaction effects like you're claiming do you have any comments on those uh yes so um so um yes in fact i'm i'm working i've got a student working with Haley at the moment because i'm interested in all, in all, in all of these approaches um so 
at basically the the simulations stop when the dust approximation breaks down so in a lot of these things so, so they they so so devolution doesn't assume a dust thing oh um, it's just <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah. So, so yeah. So, so um, actually, Haley, some, I think, the, some, yeah. I think Haley quite there. assumes dust, but um, the G-volution ones definitely don't. They're just particle simulations. Yeah, but you're so so. Well, there are things. So so, it's it's all a question of of calibration, um, and so, uh, you, well, I mean. I, but so, but they so, pick a typical yeah. observer, right? You would not pick a typical halo to be the observer. Well, in, in I mean, I, 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 G, G, G evolution does a number of. So, what I'm concerned about, and I don't, you know, uh, there's a, they renormalize the homogeneous mode, whatever. So there are a number of things that are done, which, when if you're looking at it, only from the point of view of I'm looking for a small percentage effect. You know, so there are people who, who think about everything in terms of um, adding up omegas, right? And uh, so for us, for, for me, uh, uh, what is a tiny effect, you know, it's, so the back reaction itself is never large, is, is most 4%. Um, but four percent, depending on how you calibrate it, can be something big. So, I'm, um, yeah, I, 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 I don't, yeah, I, mm. I, I don't know enough about the details, and I'm yeah. certainly interested in learning about that. Those. So, so one thing, do. one thing we did um, a couple of years ago was to do um, a fully relativistic ray tracing. Um, so you take an observer and you ray trace to um, halos. Um, and then you can plot the Hubble diagram, um, yeah. and it, it, it finds that there's there's no large effect on the Hubble diagram beyond that, that's beyond what's predicted from perturbation theory. Um, right. So that yeah, was, so that was you know the, the the observables I think are the are the key key things to compute if there's to be a back reaction effect, which is important. Right. So, so again, it is, it is the observer, you know, so the, you will always be cutting out some small scale physics. And it's the small scale physics where the dust approximation breaks down. And I, um, I can't comment on anybody's. So yeah. you know, no, no, no one is, 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 uh, is simulating things down to the level of galaxies. Um, I don't think. Uh, yeah, so as, as far as I'm concerned, well, there's always finite resolution effects. Yeah, but we, I mean, yeah, we yeah, did yeah, yeah. Um, convergence studies. As you as you increase the number of halos, the effects don't the effects stabilize a bit. So, but I agree yeah. that the, the small scale effects could could still so, change. Yeah. So 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 as far as I'm concerned, it's it, it, you know, so, and, and uh. I mean, th there are many ways which one could do with, with numerical relativity that you could, you know, try and study some of these issues uh, in a different way. So it's, it's, um, you know, um, I think there's a huge amount of work to be done, and uh, I'm certainly interested in, uh, in 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 those approaches in future. But uh, you know, uh, I, I, yeah, I'll, okay. I'll leave it. Thanks. There. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, before you go, could I quickly ask you, yeah. don't you think that the fact that we are not typical observers might also make a difference in uh, those ray tracing exercises? Yeah, I mean, you, that but the, yeah, you can do, um, you can just plonk your observer where you like in the simulation. Um, we did yeah. that. So, so that changes the Hubble diagram below like redshift of 0.1 or something, yes. um, of course. But, um, you know, beyond that, everything's sort of stable, it seems. But that is, as David was saying, crucial for the calibration. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, well, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Um, so whether people have taken that into account, I don't know. I assume so, but yeah, that's, that's my point. I don't think they have. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, I've got my turn in the sun now. Can I ask David a question, please? Please do. Uh, okay, David, to change the topic, uh, 
you have talked about differential expansion of space and the fact that uh, we are not doing things quite right in just doing a local special relativistic boost, say to uh, you know uh, mimic the uh, dipole, etc., and other such things. Now, the only evidence for this uh, differential expansion of space that you have looked at uh, is local galaxy catalogs where you have tried to identify uh, the corresponding features to your you know future null infinity or whatever you call it Final in your yeah, yeah. Can, can you uh, say okay, i mean i'm sorry to be so sort of <laughs> direct about this but do you really think one could actually find hard evidence uh, for this differential expansion of space from currently available data because that would actually be quite an important game changer in our discussions about uh, you know the validity of the usual boost from heliocentric to cmb observables and so on uh, would you like uh, to yes. say something so so the the problem is that it's, it's a very hard problem uh <laughs> to, to do yeah, that's why i'm asking about the observational aspect the theoretical aspect as you say is quite complicated uh, but, but no, you did point out, you did point to the fact that the variance of the Hubble flow is minimized in the local group frame, right? Yes. And that's an interesting observation. So I'm requesting you to amplify on that. Okay. Um, I don't have all my additional slides for this one, but... Um, uh, I mean, just to kind of uh, uh, you know suggest something, should we, for example, be analyzing cosmological data in the local group frame because that perhaps approximates most closely to the typical co-moving observer or free free falling yep. observer? Okay. So 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 my ideal would be the following: that we um, if we go to Okay, so I, I haven't um, all right, all right. So 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 there are all these anomalies, and the 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 one that concerns you know that 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 this boost. So the epoisy move paper it moves across the sky, and uh, and that's the, the sort of thing that um, if if you consider the the low multipoles. So what I would like to see done is that this is reanalyzed in the arrest frame in which is um, locally isotropic uh, as far as the expansion is concerned. So what we do in this paper here is to try to define um, what we would expect as anomalous terms, right? So if you were to do, and I don't know that it's exactly the local group frame. So what I did with James Mackay was to, because we could, there's a lack of data in the zone of avoidance, and you can do essentially a boost in the plane of the galaxy, and um, and uh, get the same minimum variance. So all I can say is that the local group frame and any frame with boosts in the uh, plane of the galaxy, those are the ones in which the uh, CMB, in which the um, local expansion is most isotropic. So if we forget about um, trying to move everything to the CMB frame, but look for the frame in which the local expansion is most isotropic, then uh, if you were to, to take that frame, and it's a real problem because you will have a uh, you will have a dipole in that frame, and that dipole, um, you know, it's what other people would call uh, you know the the difference between an intrinsic so an intrinsic dipole. Um, from the point of view of people who think about the standard model and uh, you know have some some huge thing on the sky uh, at, on the last scattering surface or a foreground non-kinematic dipole, I think those you know are very difficult 
to distinguish, but from uh, th this point of view is that if you look at the frame in which the local expansion is most isotropic, so you get rid of- Is, is, you know, that, the, is that the local groove frame? That's what I'm asking. Is, is that what you would it, advocate? It is, it is very so that's work with James Mackay monthly note MN rats. It, it is it, it is the local group frame up to a boost in the plane of the galaxy because we can't constrain things in the plane of the galaxy because there is um, no data there. <laughs> so you, so you we do this analysis in independent shells and you can boot do arbitrary boot. So we did a, a search and and do arbitrary boosts. And you see that the plane of the galaxy is not is you can do a boost there and, and not be constrained. And, the, that, and that's a problem when it comes to, to actually doing what I because uh, I've, I've discussed this with Francois um, is, is that the map making, um, removing the galaxy and removing the dipole, I think it's sort of done together at the same time and you'd really it's a really hard problem but the I, as far as I'm so you just if, if you were to do this analysis and remove what looks like a non-kinematic dipole then the question is do all these anomalies does it change because there is something <laughs> Uh, everybody finds all these things and they're saying, well, it's non-kinematic. And I'm saying, well, okay, we can, we can even with a simple Zekerish, uh, assume Lambda CDM outside of some local foreground, that, I mean, Zekerish is not simple, it's really complicated, but um, you can, we, we, we can come up with lots of different models, which, which will, and, you know, uh, which will give you non-kinematic things and which will give you terms which you would say were anomalous if you... But, but observationally, you David, if I can press you on this, that thing that you just showed was with composite. Uh, now we do have access to catalogs uh, which can yeah. get around the zone of extinction. You can use infrared catalogs, for example. And we have new data. I mean, this thing that we did following you was from composite. Yeah. Uh, but we, so, we so not we... be this with more up to date data from cosmic flows, etc., to try and pin so this down because flows, it's yeah. So, so cosmic flows they don't, uh, they're they don't, there are all these uh biases which are very hard to deal with, and uh, so, so, uh, and that's so what you now cosmic flows for uh, in the northern sky, so uh, some of those. Issues are being addressed. Uh, yeah, I yeah. So I I know that there we, we couldn't use cosmic flows to uh, cosmic. So the monopole contribution. Um, so which some people the, the Hubble bubble this that the other which is precisely the 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 the, the sort of signature that um, I, I'm expecting. Um, those so. <laughs> The, the way that that was dealt with uh, so in yeah so there the, there are there are a whole lot of systematic issues which I've discussed in detail with Hélène Courtois Lyon and um, yeah so I, I don't um, with really good data then yes you could do this uh, and if it's you know and that's um, what all these, you know, if we've got fantastic data, then, uh, and, and we know how to deal with the systematic um, uncertainties and all those Malmquist biases and various, you know, there's the inhomogeneous Malmquist bias. There are all sorts of ones which uh, are, are very difficult to deal with. And the problem it's is- not I'm denying that this is difficult, but all I'm asking is, don't you think it's worth doing? Right? Because we have to make oh, some absolutely. progress. With Absolutely. I, I wish that people would do it. So the, the one problem is, and all of this stuff, is that when something looks, um, if it gives problems with the Hubble parameter, then that's seen as a reason for there being um, some uncounted for systematic. So, uh, and so as long as uh, one could look at this in way, you know, 
absolutely it should be done and and we need to, to define a frame in which the the local expansion counting for all the biases which are obviously there, there uh, is most uniform and which frame is that as far as i can see it's it's close to the frame of the local group and if we were to do that, then some of that dipole is non-kinematic, and then we can test, you know, you'd have to redraw the whole map of the sky. I mean, the, cold, the hot and cold spots would be different, you know, statistically be the same, but it'd be different. I mean, so it's just a huge problem. But anyway, that's what should be done. Uh, Thank so you. Uh, Thank regarding this dipole map that you're showing, so this is extracted from, uh, uh, from uh, not from using the L, L plus minus one couplings that are induced due to a dipole model, I mean, uh, this uh, Doppler boost sort of effect. I mean, uh, the a slide below. Yeah, and uh, this was followed up in the next uh, release. I mean, this is a figure that I remember from 2013, but in 2015, it was done uh, with a much better uh, frame, I mean, uh, setup. So uh, I'm not sure what you are alluding to, like it being a systematic. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, so, yeah, the, the, the audio is a, a bit poor here. Uh, you, you're not sure what I'm alluding to, what being a systematic? Yeah, here, I mean, the title, yeah. Okay, so, if I have expansion which does not reduce to a boost and in a general relativity in general that is the case then um, you can have models which have a non-kinematic dipole mm -hmm. so what so what, what what are the systematic issues there this is all we all we're doing here is defining what we would call a non-kinematic dipole which you could therefore go and test David, we had this in the talk this morning, though. This is essentially what Miguel was doing, right? Ah, yeah, so, to, no. To, to, well, well, exactly. Because, I mean, he has to assume that Doppler and aberration are the same direction to have that's, a boost, right? Right, 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 right. Exactly, and that's, that's what... And, and, that, and they weren't. They were uh, in yes. slightly different directions. So is that what that plot is, this one here? That is what this plot is. That's aberration and, and the Doppler... The, so if you do... Dot, yeah. Yeah. So if you do, so if you do that, then uh, this will only work if you if you cut your multipoles off down at five hundred. So so it points in the wrong direction if you include the. Um, that Normal. is because of the power asymmetry that is yes. seen at the low multipole. Yeah, exactly so right. Multiple, so the question is, why is there a power asymmetry? So so the thing is that the. The, the point is that there are some problems, right? And oh, they are, I think that it, is that the like, anomalous power power asymmetry. Yeah. That's the one that we're yes, meant yes. to. Yes. That's the one that's connected to the dipole. By this is what Wen Zhao talked about. Uh, yeah. Was that yesterday? I think it was yesterday. Was it yesterday or today? There was a power cut well, for the whole day. Uh, but uh, there are two axes that I pointed on the first day of the meeting that. That there is one towards the hemispherical power asymmetry, some axis accumulating there, and some axis accumulating towards the CMB dipole. And roughly mm -hmm. they are perpendicular to each other. So I asked, like, as if I'm saying it out loud, that how, what are your thoughts, sort of a thing. Right. So, so um, this is the one that is moving towards the dipole because more and more power is uh, in the from the Doppler boost is uh, adding up. When you take this bin window of 500 to 2000, because I mean, in this, this is the analysis that I did uh, while I was at Ayuka. So I know this analysis. Yeah. So, so well, um, so. Uh, but but, as, but so, things so, were consistent, so, so, right? Within one sigma this morning, right? Uh, the directions. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, so, so anyway, is it, well, I mean, you know, um, Oh, because it's right. So, 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 so that's the yeah. I mean, uh, it, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the fact that that there is a direct the, the extent to which the things agree um, is you know it's it's relate. There is a power asymmetry. Um, 
if you're asking what is kinematic and what is non-kinematic, well, you can you can easily um, construct a toy model um, in which you will have a non-kinematic thing, and uh, then the question is, does the CMB mm. look anomalous if you do that? Uh, you know, uh, that that's the work that has to be done. But you know, the fact that they that there is a directional dependent, you know, yeah, so you can say, okay, they agree within one sigma or something. And yeah, it was that, some one to two, right, something like right, that. Right. right. Then the question is, what? Why are there all that? So, so that I, I, you know, I, I don't claim that this is a, a, a signature, um, but it is, uh, you know, I mean, it's a thing to be tested, and then this is precisely the sort of of signature that you would expect with a non with non kinematic um, differential expansion, which is generic in, in any model based on general relativity, which does not um, re reduce everything to boosts. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So, and and just I mean, we 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 searched for the local group frame just because that was close to finite infinity, and I got a result which I which was I. I, I couldn't believe uh, getting that that the the, the the variation was was so much reduced. I, anyway, thanks, hey, Steve. Yeah, we're going to close. So, uh, well, I, I want to ask. I want Christoph Solder. If you've got a really quick question, we have to close the session pretty much now. But if you have a question, Christoph, uh, it was my comment on. The whole discussion is measuring the differential expansion rate because that's what I tried to do for my PhD thesis back then. And yeah. as David summarized, I had long discussion with David, it's very complicated. And one big issue which wasn't mentioned in the whole discussion is actually the cosmic variance. So uh, in even within Lambda CDM simulations, if you predict some within a small volume corresponding to what like SCSS observes, the variation you might expect in just by random sampling, it's surprisingly big effect. And we couldn't find any deviation within outside of the scatter of Lambda CDM. But to be fair to David's models, uh, we don't have good simulations with going down to galaxy scale to give a fully fair comparison. So we just distorted a Lambda CDM model <laughs> a bit to make some prediction in his direction. But yeah, it's a very complicated issue. And one other thing is it's currently most peculiar velocity service. That's what you have to look at to get this data. Uh, hemispherical in the sense that if you need self-consistent data, you can't easily combine data from two different services. They have different samplings, different biases. And yeah, so we are stuck now with SDSS in the north, and then DAISY will be a little bit larger. It gets a little bit of the source collected cap as well, the DAISY peculiar velocity survey I'm involved, but it won't solve the issue. And now that type bank got canceled, which we hope we have an overlap with to maybe address the systematics. It's, yeah, we have a task of data in the cells to basically do some full sky comparison. So it's always, we have one better data and yeah. Okay, that's it. Yeah. Um, I, I can say from the, the point of view of bulk flows and things, if people do the uh, KSZ effect, then I wouldn't expect, you know, so people can test the idea of bulk flows somehow with the KSZ effect. So I, uh, th there's, there's all this discussion back and forth, and that's exactly the, because it's a sort of local in a, in a different, um, you know, far away, that is the sort of thing which I think would not show up the spurious, uh, what, what, what I claim is, if, if you do a spurious boost of, of um, 600 kilometers per second to just based on kinematics, and that's not the frame in which the expansion is most uniform, then um, that's going to show up in some things, but not in others. So in particular, I mean, I, I would expect this to be very controversial and there to be arguments back and forth about this um, within the context of the standard uh, model. Okay, that's great. 
Okay, so uh, I'm going to close the session and we've run over by a long time. I apologize for that. Um, but thank you very much for all the speakers this afternoon, uh, this evening. Uh, very interesting talks, lots of nice discussion. Uh, so, um, yeah, okay, so I'll see you tomorrow, everybody. All right, uh, thanks, Stephen. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. All right.